it's stepping right. You cannot see the screen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Singapore. Good morning, world. Welcome to World Speech Day, Singapore 2021. This year's theme is Humanity at Crossroad, Diversity, Equity, Inclusions. Today, the world is becoming more and more polarized. How can we bring people back together and yet retain their uniqueness? My name is Chu Ban Singh, Charter President, Rotary E-Club of 3310. On my right is Jing Kok Wing, past president, Rotary E-Club of 3310, and organizing chair, World Speech Day Singapore 2021. On my left is Dr. Ernest Chen, past district governor, Toastmasters International, and founder of World Speech Day Singapore. All of us are members of YMCA Toastmasters Club, all distinguished Toastmasters. Today, we are your hosts for most of the session, except for the Rotary Hour, a showcase later in the afternoon. World Speech Day Singapore started early in 2016 after a very successful 50-hour speech marathon to celebrate Singapore's 50th anniversary. This SG50 event was organized by YMCA Toastmasters Club, where we fundraised something like 40,000 plus to support the YMCA of Singapore community service uh, courses. Since the inauguration on 15th of March 2016, Rotary E-Club of 3310 has been involved with YMCA in joining, organizing, and hosting World Speech Day every year. This year, with COVID restriction, we have to move from impersonal appearances to hosting a mix between virtual as well as hybrid live streaming. So we are all very excited to learn new ways to communicate and reach out to the world at large. Indeed, World Speech Day is a great platform for public speakers to engage the world. This year, we have speakers not just locally from Singapore, but from overseas as well, who are willing to lend their voice and share their passion for a better world. Today, humanity is at a crossroads. Let us open our eyes, our ears, and heart to see, to hear, and to learn from the diversified groups of speakers, their views on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Ladies and gentlemen, together, let us welcome the very first speaker, organizing chair, Jung Kok Wing, president, YMCA Toastmasters Club, Singapore. Jung Kok Wing. Today, Hundreds of cities, thousands of people around the world are giving speeches to celebrate World Speech Day. Singapore is the first city in the world to organize World Speech Day on 15 March in 2016. This year is the sixth year running and I'm proud to be the sixth organizing chair to shoulder the heavy responsibility to make it happen a one-day event where people who desire their voices to be heard speak to the audience out there in the world to share ideas. Until this year, World Speech Day Singapore had always been held physically with a physical audience in an auditorium. Thanks to YMCA Singapore, who allowed us to use their fabulous auditorium at a very affordable cost. Last year, a clash with another event prevented us from using the YMC auditorium. We went into Malacca, Malaysia, 
to run the event jointly with the Malaysians to celebrate World Speech Day together. We were really lucky because the very day we returned back to Singapore, both nations went into lockdown due to a pandemic called COVID-19. This year, with the pandemic showing little sign of going away, we have a new challenge. A physical event would be prohibitive, though not impossible. The organizing committee therefore decided to go virtual. After all, not just Singaporeans, but practically everyone in every country had one full year of practice, living their lives, connecting with other people virtually. So it is easy to organize World Speech Day Singapore virtually, you would think, because everyone is doing Zoom meeting already these days, right? Wrong. I will not bore you with the technicalities, but suffice to say that Organizing a show which you are about to enjoy, watching it stream live from the website, the Facebook of Rotary E Club of 3310 is hard work. With limited resources of hardware as well as software, we make do with recording most of the speeches we will use to showcase using nearly the recording function of Zoom and also a very basic video editing tool called Filmora to put all the speeches into a big video that you are about to enjoy. We owe a big thank you to Rotary with Clarence Young, who graciously agreed to be our media sponsor. Without Clarence, there will be no live streaming. This year, the Rotaractors are working hand in hand with the Rotarians and the Toastmasters under Elevate Rotaract and Rotary Toastmasters Alliance to jointly host World Speech Day Singapore. The infusion of young spirit makes a lot of difference. And you are going to find out what wonders the Rotaractors can do. So to all you audience out there, sit back, relax, and enjoy the fruit of Elevate Rotaract and Rotary Toastmasters Alliance. In the comfort of home, stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you, Tim Kowin. <clears throat> Our next speaker is somebody who is really dear to us. She has been, I would call her, a patron saint of the World Speech Day. She has been a patron and a special guest of honor for many of our YMCA World Speech Day event. Today, because of COVID, we couldn't really personally invite her to deliver a speech. So she has kindly volunteered to do a recording so that she can share her message with us. This wonderful lady is Miss Joanne Pereira, and she is the Member of Parliament of Tanjung Paga GRC. So ladies and gentlemen, can we invite Joanne Pereira to come on? Thank you. A very good morning to each and every one of you. My name is Joan Pereira, Member of Parliament for Tanjung Paga GRC. Thank you very much to the Organising Committee of World Speech Day 2021 for inviting me to address you. Although we are very comfortable these days in meeting virtually, it was a very different environment at this time last year. We are in a world fraught with a tsunami of changes. Proper communication, care and support for one another are even more important. We have seen through recent world events how the power of words can bring people together, unify them, or divide a country. That is why I'm so glad that the organizing committee has brought us all together today to celebrate the power of words in making 
for a better world tomorrow. I wish each and every one of you and your family members peace, good health and happiness and may you have an enriching session today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Joan Pereira, Member of Parliament, Tanjung Paga GRC. I now like to invite another person who actually we started the World Speech Day together with our Singapore founder, Ernest, Dr. Ernest Chen. Dr. Ernest Chen will later share some of his stories on how World Speech Day first began. Let us, without much ado, welcome the founder of World Speech Day from United Kingdom, Mr. Simon Gibson. Hello. World Speech Day is turning out to be quite a remarkable day in the calendar. Today, thousands of people around the world are giving speeches. In 2021, we have remarkable events at World Speech Day Singapore, World Speech Day Japan, in Morocco, Ghana, in Nigeria, Mexico, Italy, France, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, India, Pakistan, China, Russia, the USA, Malaysia, Mongolia. I could go on, of course. And please forgive me if I have not mentioned your nation, because some 100 countries will be celebrating World Speech Day 2021 sometimes at live events, often by Zoom. But whatever the mechanism, the goal is always the same, to share ideas. But I think that the spread of World Speech Day also reminds us of the wider role and value of public speaking, above and beyond sharing ideas. Public speaking can be a driving force in bringing society together. Public speaking indeed brings people together. It is an act of understanding. As such, it is a precious contribution to communities in every culture. The theme for this year's World Speech Day is humanity at a crossroads. At a crossroads, one is faced with choices. At this point, we face the choice of what response to make to the pandemic how we shape our future. For example, we could become more isolated and protectionist, or we can become more global in outlook. That is a choice. At a crossroads, one is forced to look both ways, to determine what is valuable and worth protecting, and what can be changed. As a result, perhaps we see more clearly what really matters. At first glance, it may seem that public speaking is not what should concern us right now. It's something that, frankly, we can survive without. But in fact, when we stop and look those both ways, we realise that speeches and culture and music and the arts and our social lives matter to us. Indeed, we must protect what seems insignificant. That is a lesson for me from the pandemic. That is a lesson at this crossroads to humanity. There is a famous poem by Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken. In it, he uses the image of a crossroads, or at least two roads diverging. And he says, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. My point, is that we should not be afraid to take the road less travelled, to protect and stand up for those parts of our lives which may seem inconsequential or simply nice to have, but in which, in fact, are fundamental to us. They are a relief of the heart, or perhaps the heart in relief. I sometimes remark that whenever something important happens in the world, someone makes a speech. But equally, when someone makes a speech, something important happens. A kind of magic is released. Because in the act of speaking, we can become another, 
We step outside ourselves and become our public person. I think this may explain why so many of us are afraid of public speaking, because we are being asked to connect with a, a part of ourselves that we're not sure of. But this may also explain why public speaking can become so transformative, because it lets us live in a public space. It lets us live in the space of shared ideas. It sets us momentarily free through sharing. Above all, it connects us, speaker and audience, because it is an act of understanding. And ultimately, that is what we celebrate on World Speech Day. Thank you very much for being part of it. Very inspiring opening remarks. Now, I would like to invite my very good friend who will share with us on his keynote address the theme of World Speech Day Singapore. Humanity at Crossroad, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands to welcome the founding president of World Speech Day Singapore, Dr. Ernest Chen. Good morning, Singapore. Good morning, my fellow citizens of the world. I'm speaking from Singapore. Today is World Speech Day. Every year on the 15th of March, the world celebrates World Speech Day. This year, humanity at the crossroad. What is humanity to us? Humanity is a characteristic for the race of human being. What is humanity to us? Humanity means different things to different people. But by and large, we all know what is compassion. We all know what is empathy. We all know what is mercy. We all know what is respect. So what is an act of humanity? An act of humanity means we do something from the heart for our fellow citizens, for our fellow humankind. For instance, you can give a glass of water to a stranger. You can lead a child across the road. You can help an aged person do something. My dear fellow citizens of the world, this is a simple act of humanity. Every one of us is endowed with this sort of quality in us. But why can't we do it? Humanity at a crossroad. Yes, what sort of crossroad are we talking about? We are talking about two roads that you can choose. To me, the crossroad means that either you take a hard road or you take a soft road. A hard humanity or the soft humanity. A soft humanity is something that we can do from the heart. Small things, the big effect. Small gesture can make into a big return. For instance, while working in my office, I saw a cleaner of foreign workers walking past my office. I say, hi, do you like a glass of water? He said, yes. So I brought the glass of water to him. So this is a small act of gesture. We can build harmony among the mankind. Like for instance, you can join service club and render service projects. You can go into the Egypt home to help the Egypt people. All this is we do from the heart. But what is the heart humanity? To me, Heart humanity is something that you create political change, like revolution, change of political effect for the country. 100 years ago, probably women has no vote. But then, through protest, 
through a lot of political changes, the woman got the vote. This is called gender equity or gender equality. By doing that, we change the world. We give the gender voices. The woman has become more powerful, sometimes even more than men. We all know in America in 1861 to 1865, there was a big civil war. Not only people were killed, but many people were broken up because of the disunity among the country. The President Abraham Lincoln advocated the abolition of civil slavery. This is the political change. This is called equity. This is called diversity. Eventually, the right preview. The wrong will bury. America abolished slavery. But in America, is the equity still exists today? I leave it to you to judge. Of course, this is the hard humanity. Ladies and gentlemen, whether it's a hard humanity or soft humanity, the change got to be there. The better world has to be seen. Along the way, different changes in different era, different transformation in the different time. We must embrace change. We do it because on the heart. We are not politicians. We may not have political ambitions, but we can do small things at a big way. Only last Friday, after submitting my income tax at the ERAS in Singapore, I took a path to go to opposite side, underground. As I walked underground, in front of me was the lady in a beautiful pastel color dress. And she carried a shoulder bag that matches the color of the dress. I thought I would give her a surprise, give her a sweet surprise. I quickened my pace. I was two steps away from her. I said, hello, good morning. She turned her head in, at a very fast pace and she quickened her pace, wanted to get away from me. In order to keep pace with her, I sort of walked faster. While we were reaching the other side, walking up, I called up again, good morning. She quickened her pace and disappeared among the crowd. Why? I was surprised. In fact, I want to create a good day for her. I want to say, Excuse me, young lady, you have a good sense of dressing. I like your dress. I like your ma uh, the matching bag that you're carrying, you know. Have a good day. But I didn't have a chance to compliment her. Compliment a person is a way of humanity because you make a day for this person. But I suppose that she was too afraid. Compliment is the encouragement. Compliment is a motivation. It is a kind act of humanity. My dear friends, in 1996, while I was the CEO of YMCA Singapore, we were repairing computers and then ship it to the countries in India and Pakistan for the poor people. There were two boys. They were helping us to repair the computers and get ready the computer to be shipped. Two Indian left. One day, one of the boys and his mother came to see me in the office. Good morning, Mr. Chen. I said, good morning. I would like you to help us. I said, what can I do for you? So the mother said, this son, Basu, he got a scholarship to study aeronautical engineering at University of Michigan. But the American embassy refused to issue the visa to him. I said, why? Because we could not show the American embassy that we have enough fund to help the boy to go through the four-year course. But you have a scholarship. Yes, he got a scholarship as a tuition fee, but we don't have enough money to see him through the four years. However, I'm going to work, I'm going to send him the money. But the American embassy wants to see that I have $100,000 in the bank account in order to issue the visa. After pondering a while, 
I said, sure, no problem. Because I have in mind of calling YMCA board and ask them to lend you $100,000. All right, I'll let you know good news tomorrow. I called up the president. Instead of getting me a positive reply, the president gave me a harsh word. Ernest, you must be mad. Why? YMCA, even though it's a charitable organization. But what happened? If the family does not return me the money, does not return us the money, we're finished. Who's responsible for that? I kept quiet. He put down the phone. I realized that by helping the boy, it's in vain. Next day, the family came to see me again. I said, very sorry. I cannot find you $100,000. But Mr. Chen, you must help us. You must help us. After a few seconds of deep thinking, I told the mother, all right, I help you. I will withdraw the money from my saving account and lend you the money. But how are you going to return the money? The moment the American embassy issued the visa, maybe a week or two, I will return you the money. I took her words for it because I wanted to help the family. If the boy hasn't got a chance to go to America, his life will not change and his family will also in deep shape. In fact, I've forgotten the matter. I get quiet. Nobody knows it. Only my PA and I realize this is the thing that I've done. Nine days later, I got a call from the mother. Mr. Chen, Mr. Chen, I also got a visa. I'm coming to your office now and return you the money. That was the greatest news of my life. They came, they repaid me the money. And then quietly, I told myself, I changed the life of this Indian family. And I told the mother, please contact with me and I'd like to know the progress of Vasu and I'd like to see that you graduated with honor and come back to Singapore to serve the country. Yes, yes, Mr. Chen, for sure. After that, they left my office. That was the last time I heard from them. Until 2004, I think about eight years down the road. I have a public speaking preview. You won't believe it in YMCA. And this Indian man want to see me. You know what he say? He said, Mr. Chen, can you recognize me? I said, I could not recognize you. I'm the other Indian boy that repaired a computer. My name is Siva. And he handed me a card. I look at the AIA insurance agent. I said, yeah. I'm sure Basu must have told you the good news. He graduated, he made money, and then the whole family immigrated to America. I said, Siva, frankly speaking, I didn't hear a single word from them. Huh? Really? I said, yes. What an ungrateful family. Never. I said, never. So that was the last time I heard from Siva. Well, my dear friend, what can we do? I just let it pass. This is human being. You know what happened? 2014, I get a trunk call from America to my handphone. Actually, it's a long distance call. Hello, Mr. Chen. Hello. I'm Basu's mother. I said, I could not remember. You no, know, you know, you're an angel from YMC. Suddenly, he struck me. I say, what can I do for you? You see, my whole family is so grateful. They all immigrated to America. My other daughter is married. And Basu married an Indian lady. They have a very, very happy family. I say, why don't you come and see me? Oh, yes, I will, I will, I will. Basu didn't write to you? I said, no. Okay, I asked Basu to write to you. Wish you the best. When you return to Singapore, just give me a call. We can have a dinner together. That was also the last time I heard from the mother. My dear friend, each one of us has a heart. If we can motivate our heart to help somebody, the world is much better. A small thing can go a long way. I'm happy I transformed the Indian family. I mean, the whole families were very happy staying in America. Ladies and gentlemen, I urge you, each one of you, have a humanity 
and do something. We are at the crossroad. We cannot be on the hard road, but we can be on the soft road. Together, we can change the world. Together, we can make the world a better place. Ladies and gentlemen, humanity at a crossroad. If you're brave and bold, take the hard road. You are a timid but a very concerned citizen of the world. Take on the soft road and help the world to change. I believe that when we change others, we also change ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, have a good day. Continue the work of humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ernest. I think there were, there were two very interesting stories from Ernest's speech. One was about the beautiful girl. And I guess, you know, she probably misunderstood what's the intention of Ernest. And she was really, really scared out by his action. The other was the fact that Ernest was so kind now to actually loan a hundred thousand dollars to the lady so that the son can actually get a visa to America. Today, in this world of the internet, I will be scared off to even try to lend a thousand dollars because they'll probably end up being scammed. So ladies and gentlemen, we have to be very careful. We got to use, exercise our judgment and hopefully we are able to make the right decision. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the opening session that we have. We are going to now go into the live streaming speeches. Before I ask and, the, uh, and go into that particular section, perhaps I can ask Dr. Ernest Chen to tell us the story that how World Speech Day Singapore really started and his conversation with Simon Gibson. Thank you, Ban Singh. It is always the greatest pleasure to share with you how World Speech Day started. It started actually in 2013. I was attending a speech writers conference in Bournemouth, England. It was a three days conference. And in one session, I was seated next to this gentleman, Simon Gibson. After sitting down together, we exchanged name card and he gave me his name card and we didn't talk much. I said that he told me he was a professor in the university teaching English literature, something in the way. I told him that I'm a speaker and a trainer. I come to Bunga to learn about speech writing. And that was the moment that we had together, maybe for 20 minutes sitting down there, listening to somebody presenting something about speech writing. After that, we didn't contact each other. It was in 2015, if I'm not mistaken, it's towards the end of December. Suddenly, I received a call from my handphone. Said, oh no, Simon Gibson. Honestly, I've forgotten the name. <laughs> it's a Simon Gibson. Hey, World Speech Day. This is something I had in mind. I met you at the Speech Writers Conference. I think it was two or three years ago. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember, I remember, I remember. I have something to tell you there. You know? I want to start the World Speech Day. I want to hear your opinions for it. It was very coincident at that moment. I think we just finished 50 hours of speech marathon at YMCA. At that moment, we were having a briefing session, I think about five days after the Christmas day where we have a speech marathon. And we're having a meeting at the YMCA cafe. And he called up and I talked to him. I said, oh, I finished the 50 hours. You want me to do three hours of world speech? It's no problem. He said, are you sure? I said, yes, I believe that we can do it. Then he told me that 15 of March is the day. I said, are you sure you want to get 15 of March? He said, yes. So I have about three months to prepare. I told him, no problem. No problem. I get a committee started and then I let you know the result. All right, Simon, it's all go. I told him, A-OK, all OK. That was the time. Later on, we communicate through WhatsApp and through email. 
We were so impressed with the organization in Singapore. In fact, on 15th of March 2016, Singapore was the first country to stage a World Speech Day because Singapore saw daylight first before London. At that moment, I think we only have about six to ten countries organize the World Speech Day. So I'm so happy to make Simon as a good friend and we travel on the journey of World Speech Day. Just before the World Speech Day in 2016, I was returning home from America by way of London. I think it was in 1st of March or something in that way. And Simon drove all the way from his hometown to Beechrow Airport. And we have a coffee and tea together and talk about the progress of World Speech Day. I'm so happy that I make a good friend with Simon. And also I made many good friends in Singapore and all over the world. This is how World Speech Day started and how World Speech Day was born. Thank you. Thank you, Ernest. I think we have come a very long, long way since then, six years ago. Today, we have a lot of speakers who want to speak on our platform. If I count it correctly, we have something like 80 speakers throughout the day today. We begin by having five sessions. Five sessions. The first session would have 13 speakers in all. Before I actually talk about the speakers and I ask my other people to comment, I just want to tell you that we are very grateful to all the friends that we came across. People came from Rotary, Rotaract, Toastmasters, Agora, and friends of friends. So perhaps maybe Ernest would like to comment on the 13 speakers on the first block. Ernest, yeah. Wow. When we first started, we didn't know who were the people willing to speak. But the moment I let the news out, many of them wanted to speak. Wanted to speak and getting on the road and really speaking is two different matters. We all know that, isn't it? I mean, it's all about commitment. It's all about, you know, promises. However, I'm happy that at least more than 60% of the people I spoke to they really jump on the wagon and help us. The first session, we are very good speakers. They're all my very good friends. And some of them are my friend's friend from, from India all the way by uh, Navin. He said, Ernest, I'll get you some very good speaker from India. And they really like to speak on World Speech Day. So that is the reason why we, <clears throat> we get the international speakers. We even actually uh, have uh, speakers uh, from USA. Yeah. And from UK. Yes. Uh, you know, there's one speaker that is an uh, American that works in the missionary in the Java. That's so right. He's going to tell some very interesting stories. Fantastic. Yes. And uh, all these speeches actually is done through a Zoom meeting. <laughs> and uh, we only use the recording function of Zoom and we produce some very wonderful results. So I hope you're going to enjoy the following 13 speeches. Shall we? Let's go. The first speaker is Ms. Chan Su Ming. Wow. Innovate or die, famously said Peter Drucker, the father of management. He was not interested in business per se, but he was driven to create what he termed as a functioning society, his vision, if you will. And we all need to innovate, be it to solve problems or meet opportunities, hopefully with the goal of getting closer to our vision. And the difference between innovation and invention is that one has a use case, whereas the latter, even with a pile of patents to show, may not translate to use. Hello, everyone. 11 years ago, I, I stumbled upon a secret in the small town of Ipoh, capital of the Malaysian state of Para. Unbeknown to most, it was a top fundraiser for Dr. Sun Yat Sun famous for his revolutionary efforts that toppled the Qing dynasty 
ending thousands of years of feudalism. He wanted equity for all. And in Ipo, as well as Para, the world's largest tin depository, thousands of poverty-stricken Chinese dreamed the same dream to create livelihoods for people. And that's why they left their beloved motherland to labor in Perak's minds. They contributed to his cause. And from such grim beginnings, look where China is today. It was a surprise to me that no one had picked up this place link to such an important figure, not only to put Ipo on the world map, but to regenerate Ipo and create economic opportunities that draw talent near and far and from Para to want to build exciting careers and lives in Para. This vision, ladies and gentlemen, underpins my efforts into this project since 2011, nearly 100 years after Dr. Sun was installed as the first president of the Republic of China. Ipo's role was brought to light in 2013 when the Sun Yat Sun Nanyang Memorial Hall in Singapore published my research in English and then Chinese editions. And to scale up the use case beyond what a book can offer, its content was turned into a signage marked trail in Ipoh in 2019 with help from Para State Tourism. Now, visitors or locals, near or far, physically or virtually, can follow the trail to former houses and businesses of Dr. Sun's secret society leaders, including my great-great-grandpa. You would also see sites such as the old Chinese opera house where performances were held to raise funds and raise awareness for him through their music stories. After all, facts tell, but stories sell, right? So most of these first 10 signages are located in the vibrant mural doc decorated historic quarters. And to make information accessible for all and at all times, Signages are installed outside the heritage shop houses. And I developed this visual to represent the project. I call it innovative conceptual art, aimed at making this history relevant and sexy to audiences beyond the reading history or travel buffs. In this visual, Dr. Sun's image is given an N.B. Warhol pop art treatment whilst the slump style of the white fonts is inspired by one of the most recognizable pieces of surrealist art, Salvador Dali's Melting Clocks. In juxtaposing pop and surrealist elements, I wanted to convey that there can be harmony in diversity. And to represent inclusion, the title Follow the Trail of Dr. Sun Yat-san and his comrades in Ipo is presented in Malay, Chinese, English, and Tamil, the languages of Malaysia. This project mainly aligns to three of the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and so the colors of those three goals are applied to this visual. The orange background represents goal nine, which is industry, innovation, and infrastructure, the three I's, to unleash dynamic and competitive economic forces that generate employment and income, which this project aspires to do, which explains the alignment to goal eight to create decent work and economic growth represented by the burgundy color for Dr. Sun's hair. Incidentally, goal eight aligns to his dream of people's livelihoods. To that end, I've trained teams from Perak Tour Guide Association who are enthused with this new service offer. I also want to train women from the B40, bottom 40% 40 of society, so that there are roles for them when tourism resumes. A filmmaker found in my book inspiration for his new movie. He brought a whole team of Chinese and Taiwanese super glamorous actors and production crew to Ipo for the filming of his movie. 2020 was rife with hardships for many of us, yet the digital versions of my book were completed, availing the story to a wider audience and offering an environmentally friendlier option to paperbacks. We are now in 2021, 
Plans include installing more signages and a mural of this visual. This is not the wall, but just a projection on one of several possible walls in the historic quarters. This mural will create awareness for EPO, for Dr. Sun, for the development goals and to a wide global audience. This is just one of the many innovations on the way. And finally, the navy blue used on Dr. Sun's coat represents our value of cool shared vision partners like you for partnerships as Goal 17 proposes. So wherever you are in the world, I hope that you find this project too cool to resist. It is my hope and wish that I have persuaded you of the value of innovating. And if you need help, let me know. I do it all the time. Look for all your underutilized, unutilized, tangible and intangible resources to turn them into cool propositions for real world use. Our time in life is limited. Ideally, the use case helps us to get closer to our dreams, whatever they may be. And we may not achieve those dreams in our lifetime, but what matters? And what makes our lives meaningful and fulfilling is to find ways to manifest our dreams so that in that positive space, we also attract those with shared dreams into our lives. Dr. Sun attracted thousands with his dream of creating people's livelihoods. His wife, Song Ching Ling, carried his dream forward, emphasizing equity, including equal quality for women. Recently, China's President Xi Jinping announced that China has achieved total eradication of poverty. How's that for a functioning society sought by Peter Drucker, who famously said, innovate or die. I was running late for my meeting. I rushed into the kitchen with my water bottle and I turned on the faucet. As I turned the faucet off, the water didn't stop. Oh, I don't have time to deal with this. So as I was running out the door, I yelled to my family, hey, you guys, the kitchen faucet broke. Somebody should do something. Over the next few months, there were a few more instances of things like this occurring. And I felt like I was evading my responsibility. My response was always, somebody should do something about this. It became a joke in our family. And to this, to this day, my sons will say if something goes wrong, somebody should do something about this. And then they look at me and laugh. Friends, humanity is at a crossroads. Somebody should do something. Hmm. Well, it looks like the cavalry is not coming. Apparently, that someone needs to be me or us. But I'm just one person. What can I possibly do? Humanity is so big and our issues are overwhelming. Over the last 12 months, our lives have been tumultuous. We have lost over 2 million people in this pandemic. And almost every life on the planet has been affected in one way or another. People are divided by politics around the globe. There is a rise in hate rhetoric and a decline of our environment. These are big issues. What can one person possibly do? I'm not rich and famous. I'm 
not very well connected. I don't have a huge social media following. Now, as I was thinking about this, I realized that I have a superpower and so do you. What is this superpower? Our superpower is our words. And like any superpower, our words can be used as a force of good or as a force of evil. Several years ago, I served on the board of an organization who worked with women and girls who were victims of sex trafficking. These women endured unimaginable situations and pain. Their bodies had physical evidence and scars of their pain and mutilation. But do you know what many of them said hurt even more? The verbal abuse. The words that told them that they were not loved, that they didn't matter, that their lives were just trash and they were just objects. It was those painful words that took up residence in their brain. They carved out a corner of their mind and they stayed there. Those words cut deep and left emotional scars that were far worse than their physical scars. Our words have power. Our words matter. Consider your words are able to bring people together and build bridges. Or our words can divide and start wars. Our words can lift people up, make them aspire to be the best that they can be in the world. Or our words can shut people down, make them feel inferior as if they're less than. Your words can be combined to create phrases and sentences, entire paragraphs that share innovation and inspiration and good news about your community and beyond. Or our words can be used to create phrases and sentences that spread hate and lies. The choice of words that we use every day matters. I would guess that most of us have experienced words that hurt. Perhaps not the same level as the women I just spoke of, but painful to us nonetheless. I know that I have. As a child, I was told that I was dumb. I was told that my opinion didn't matter because children should be seen and not heard. And I was constantly told that I was fat and overweight. To this day, I hear those voices in my head. If I'm given a new opportunity, the first thing I think is, oh, I'm not smart enough to do that. When I go buy a new outfit at the store and look in the mirror, I think, does that make me look fat? If I'm in a room of people I don't know very well, sometimes I choose to not say anything because I'm afraid they not, may not be interested in what I have to say. 
over the years, I've learned how to overcome those negative words. But I share this with you because if after decades, I still hear the negative voice in my head over seemingly petty things, just imagine for a moment how cutting words can be to others if they're about their culture or their skin color or their religion. Words have so much power. They are indeed our superpower. Humanity is at a crossroads. And instead of waiting for someone to do something, I'm going to do something. Won't you join me? I have a challenge. Over the next 30 days, let's see if we can harness the power of our words. Do you know we speak over a thousand words a day? Let's listen to what we're saying. And if our words are not impeccable, if we are not building others up, let's hear that and think about how we can change what's coming out of our mouth, what we're putting out into our circle of influence. Let's treat our words as seeds that we're planting, nourishing, and cultivating as the first step to building a road into the world that we want to see. Good evening, everybody, especially to my good old friend Ernest Chen, and thank you, Kuo Wing Ching, for allowing me to have these few minutes to share my thoughts on this very interesting, very timely subject. <clears throat> now, someone once said, everything on this earth has a purpose, every disease has a cure, and every person has a mission. Now, you know, we live in this world which is not perfect. That's why we have a lot of disappointments, a lot of disruptions, dissent, disengagement, separation, complaints, and what have you. Now, but fortunately for us as humans, we have the heart, we have the commitment to want to make the change, to do things, to change these negative things to to positive so that we can live in harmony you know even with the the inequality and include everybody because there's i mean the more diverse we are the more the problems will happen simple example the strong and the weak we are not equal in our intelligence in our physical strength it's accepted we can't deny the fact that we are not equal. So because of this inequality in our progress, we see the people in the village and the people in the in the in the in the city, they're different. They they don't see each other and they don't understand each other. So this is where the problem starts. But if but we are fortunate in the sense that <clears throat> we have we are brought up in a family, in a society even in the civils, even in within our country, to care and share with each other, even to care for the weak and the sick. The strong, of course, his tendency is to bully, you know, and the smart, his, his tendency is to create something for his own benefit. But because of the cultural teachings, which is handed down not only in Asia, but even in Europe, from the times of the from the time of Aristotle, 
Confucius, and all the way down. These people came because they know the human nature is violent, is evil. So these teachings are there to guide us to use our violence for the good if necessary. So all these teachings that we receive, like today, for example, we are spending this time trying to share our thoughts on how we can do good, not just with our words, but with our hearts. Important is the heart, because words really can create conflicts. Words will create arguments. Words will, can create disruption. But if we do, if we speak with our heart, we will be able to establish what we call goodwill. Uh, you know, we have goodwill, we have harmony, and we have peace. That's what we are all working towards for. Peace and progress and prosperity for each and every one. Even the weak and the sick will be cared for. And, they, and those who are smart, intelligent, rich or poor will, will have a good life. On this earth because to create the world around us we just don't use words we have to use our hearts and we have to speak from the heart and really our wise sages from the past have shared this with us many times i mean there are things like compassion love forgiveness why are these things taught to us so that we will live in a world that is not chaotic. The world that will be, you know, because this, there are forces that will cause disruption, that will cause dissension, that will want, want to be, that will cause separation even among the human, among humanity. It's natural, it's nat natural. They all want to be exclusive rather than inclusive. But in a world of today, like for example now, we are using, we are, we are really connected in this world. Through, for example, today's medium, we are this Zoom. We are all connected. You see, and even though we are diverse, we are different, but through this media, events like this, we create opportunities to share the goodness that is in this mother earth this goodness and nobody can get away with anything these these days by doing something that nobody will be aware of before that the before the invention of this mass media yes things are happening that nobody knows there's genocide that is happening somewhere in the world nobody is aware of but today you you you, you shoot a you shoot a gun or you throw a bomb everybody knows and this is the biggest deterrent for those people who wants to be separate who doesn't want to be included this media today we are very fortunate we are living and we have had peace for many years and progress for so many years until today we have this stage even with this covid where we are sitting at home some people think we are sitting at home doing nothing no we are sitting at home and sharing our moments like this together. We are sitting at home and we are sharing our thoughts together. And this is being shared throughout the world. What I'm saying today is not just to 20 odd people. I'm sure it goes to more than that after this. So these thoughts, what we are sharing today is, is what is important, is what we as humans you know, as responsible humans to our fellow men, right? As, and we are all very different. We are all very different. We all come from different backgrounds. And yes, and yet through this media, we are able to in, be inclusive with the rest. Of, for those even who are not present today, never mind, it's okay. But when they, when they click on, they listen to this, they will automatically be included. So yes, it's time now 
it's very very timely that this subject and this world speech day you know has decided to bring up this to discuss this thing seriously and yes i find that we are we are still relevant and we are more effective to be able to spread humanity preach love preach uh, inclusiveness for the good of humanity i thank you for your time humanity at a crossroad diversity inclusiveness and equity humanity is again at a crossroad i say it again because we human has had many crossroads in our history firstly what does humanity means it is the human race which include everyone on earth it's also about the qualities that make us human able to love have compassion to be creative and not a robot so this topic I'm speaking now is very timely, apps and important choice of topics that is, as it involves all of us and our world today. Humanity has faced many hard choices and is still facing many now. It can be either about our natural world like floods and famine or man-made ones like the world war that we have had. Our natural world is suffering now and the more humanity exploit nature in unsustainable ways, the more we undermine our well-being. Currently, the COVID-19 pandemic makes us to rethink our relationship with nature. Yes, and this makes us to also think about our humanity, humanness and human nature. This time round, Due to our advances, especially in technology, where we are so connected digitally, if we humans make a wrong choice this very, at this very crucial crossroad, it could lead to what I call our humanity inferno. This intense and uncontrollable fire could spread and go out of control and burn humanity. Such an impact may well spell disaster of a scale we never seen before a hell on earth so we are at a point of change that a wise courageous urgent and determined effort and choice has to be made by all of us humanity it means each and every one of us each and every one of us are involved our human race is one is one Yet within this human race, there is diversity that makes each of us unique and beautiful. It is this diversity that we should celebrate instead of abusing it, like we are doing it now in many ways. Otherwise, contentious wars among us will lead to a catastrophe. This diversity comprises our character, background, ethnicity, belief, heritage, and life experiences such a wondrous spectrum is to be enjoyed rather than becoming a cause for conflict we should instead value and recognize this diversity this is because of the unique contribution of each individual with so many type of differences that can maximize the benefit to mankind for all time to come in order for the benefit to be reaped we could look at being inclusive there are many strategies that we could use to this end. One, respect the uniqueness, the view and the potential of each human being. This will result in trust and more commitment to drive the best out of everybody. And then peace and prosperity will prevail. Secondly, educate our youth on what it means to be part of our humanity. Third, emphasize inclusiveness in our society. Four, Listen to and celebrate our differences. They are so beautiful. Fifth, encourage interaction to build friendship and a sense of community. Everyone has strengths and weaknesses, so we should help everybody develop their strength for the good of all. To sustain and have faith in our humanity, 
it is also important that there is fairness and justice in the way people are treated. In a simple word, there must be equity. This is to create true equality of opportunity, ensuring everyone the same chance of getting there, giving people what they need to enjoy full healthy life. Finally, even with this continuous conflict and disaster, especially the COVID-19 confronting us, throughout our human history, we must have faith in our humanity. It is this faith that sustained us for so long, overcoming various odds in our human journey on earth. Having faith in community, in humanity is having faith that the majority of people have the best interests of human race at heart. So despite the groom hitting us, let your humanness shine, acknowledging that human beings are at times imperfect or fallible. We must then show genuine empathy, gratitude, respect, and humanity. A single act of humanity, big or small, a welcoming smile, a helping hand, can go a long way in uplifting the human spirit. Let me end with an inspiring words by Mahama Gandhi. He said, and I quote, you must not lose faith in humanity. Humanity is an ocean. If a few drops of the ocean are dirty, the ocean does not become dirty. Yes, humanity are at a crossroad to choose. We are at this crossroad to choose. I choose diversity, inclusiveness, equity, the road to peace and prosperity for mankind. Thank you. Dear friends, how many of you have stood at a crossroad? If I can see all of you who are watching this session, perhaps many would raise your hands. According to the Cambridge Dictionary, to be at a crossroads is to be at a stage in your life when you have to make a very important decision. Some have taken the right road, while others may be lamenting on their choice and have become despondent. They are even fearful to stand at the crossroads now. But take heart, this is not the end of the road just yet. Mankind stood at a crossroads when the COVID-19 pandemic struck more than a year ago. It was no respecter of persons, whether rich or poor, no respecter of countries, whether great or small, and no respecter of life and death. The world was turned topsy-turvy with governments scrambling to source for suitable vaccines Countries began closing borders and sought ways to control and contain the virus spread places that used to have that hustle and bustle of life became like ghost towns. Office workers were advised to work from home while students had to study online. During the pandemic, it was heartening to see on television diverse groups of people coming together to alleviate the harsh and difficult conditions of their fellow human beings by providing them with food, shelter, and other meaningful gestures. Apart from the pandemic, there are perhaps many people in the world who feel they are disparaged or treated unequally because of race, language, religion, or their status in society. There needs to be a greater demonstration of compassion and tolerance in trying to understand their plight. In so doing, 
we will be able to realize the other component of inclusion. This happens when we are able to see the person from the perspective of a potential contributor to the company or work. We will then be able to include the person into a fraternity. Dear friend, how are you coping at this moment? Are you gripped with fear of the future? The challenges and discouragements in life? And as a result, you are stagnated and not able to step onto that crossroads. If you are in this state of mind, let me share with you the acronym let us A M. A stands for arrest the situation. Arrest the situation and the negative thoughts. Write them onto a notebook, notebook and analyze by yourself to determine how you have arrived to your present state of mind. You can read specific books which will help you understand your condition and thus obtain answers to your predicament. Brainstorming with a friend or family member on what steps can be taken to alleviate or rectify the situation is another positive way in uplifting yourself. The letter M stands for manage. Manage your daily routine well. List for each day and strike them off when you have completed them. This will give you a sense of achievement and boost your morale. If certain tasks are too challenging, then you will need to break the job into smaller portions. So as you continue to press on in this simple ways, the self-esteem too will grow with you. Life therefore is not a bed of roses, but the thorny branch of the rose will prick us once in a while. We will continue to pluck roses because they are beautiful. That's an attractive fragrance and appealing especially to a lady. Wonderful evening, everybody. My name is Lim Chi Hu. I'm going to talk about a uh, focus on the theme of the uh, World Speech Day uh, itself, Humanity at Crossroad. I will first approach this uh, session here by looking at each of the keywords in the team itself. Humanity, what does humanity mean? To me, it is about us, about you and about me. And it is about the human race, it's, a, it's about the human species. It relates to the concept of uh, what makes us human. That's why we talk about humanity. What makes us human, the qualities of being a human and therefore i believe it is talking about uh, are we a caring person do we care for people or only do we only care for ourselves are we peace loving people do we treat everyone as a member of the family of the human race with respect and i see that as what we mean when we talk about humanity and then from here i like to ask a few questions I would say, asking myself a few questions rather, are these qualities similar and acceptable regardless of where we are, whether I'm in Singapore, in Malaysia, in Europe, in America? Will there be a similar, a universal set of hum, human qualities? And that is something I like to think about, I like to ask myself. 
Next, I talk about crossroad. Crossroad generally refer to an intersection, just like when I'm driving, I come to an intersection. That's a crossroad. And this is where I have to make a decision which way I want to go, left or right or go straight. Yeah. And uh, it therefore requires me to, me to make a decision. And uh, when we say humanity at a crossroad, that means I'm at a point where I have uh, to think about this in, uh, in this respect here, in terms of diversity, in terms of inclusion, in terms of equality, equal, equity. Are we really at a crossroad? Is this true? We are at a crossroad. And then if we are, then which direction should we take? It therefore relates to the goal and the destination that I have in mind before I decide which way to go. And uh, again, question for me, consider the direction that I have chosen or I may choose subsequently, can it be reversed if I make a wrong direction? Now I talk about diversity. To me, diversity implies, by the word itself, it implies that there are differences. It, it talks about types, it talks about categories, it, talk about, uh, it talks about variety, and even different levels. Yeah, That's why you have diversity there. And I see this to refer to a, uh, a, a, a group of social standing, an ethnicity, a, cla a class, and even a diversity in talent, diversity in competencies, and diversity in capacities. So that means there is a, a difference yeah, between what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is bad. And uh, is this really true? Yeah, is the world filled with diversity itself? So I want to ask myself some questions. In its own, therefore, the word itself, diversity, already imply that the existence of differences. Can there be similarities within diversity? Can there be unity in diversity? Or is, or is it just a matter of human biases that diversity exists? Next, I talk about equity. I look into the dictionary and the dictionary defines equity as a quality of being fair and impartial. Then I, it leads me to question myself again. Can there really be fairness in this world? Is it simply an ideal situation to be fair, to be equitable? Or is it simply an aspiration? In fact, uh, in terms of the, in the word equal, equality, our former Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew said, actually equality itself uh, is only an aspiration. It is not practical. So I think that from that point of view there, equity itself about fairness and impartiality, is it really practical in this real world that we live in? Then I think about the word inclusion. Again, the dictionary defines it as the action or state of including or being included within the group. It is also about the practice, about the policy people have to provide access and opportunities plus resources to a group of people who might otherwise be excluded or marginalized. Uh, from here, I focus more on people with special needs. Later on, I will go into it a little bit of details on this. Again, then I ask myself, is inclusion to the mainstream possible? Right, People who are marginalized or people who have been excluded, can they be included in the mainstream of society? So I put all these concepts together and then I go further into it and I see that there's a need to ask even further question. It means, is humanity itself at a crossroad where we either support or encourage diversity, equity, and inclusion? Is it really at a crossroad? Then I now look at them one by one from my personal perspective and experience. To me, diversity, it will always be there from one generation to another. We cannot avoid and we cannot eliminate diversity. I'm a Chinese. Another person is not a Chinese, it could be a Japanese, it could be an Australian, all right? So there will always be diverse group, diverse races, diverse ethnicity. They get married, they, they have offspring, so one generation to another, this remains. Even in cross marriages nowadays, there will be diversity. So we have to accept the fact that diversity will remain. The more important thing is, 
whatever it is, diversity in race, in religion, in language, ethnicity, in competencies that one has, we must remember, yes, we are diverse, but the important thing is we are all human. Our blood is red, red whatever race, religion that you may be in. But however competent or intelligent you may be, we, our blood is still red. We are all human race, of the human race, although diversity exists. Therefore, we need to embrace diversity and work towards unity in diversity. Equity itself, the quality of being fair and impartial, is this possible? Is, or is this simply an ideal state, only what philosophers talk about? Yes, 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 we can have uh, equity. We must go for equity. From our life experiences, from your life experiences, you have worked in the office, you have met people from the social setting. Is, it, is life always fair? Do we always encounter setback and we find that, hey, this is not fair to me? So from my life experiences, my take is this. Equity is one of the most difficult values for us to acquire, all right? And uh, even if I can, I can be an equitable person and I practice it, my challenge, the challenge to me is, am I able to sustain it? We are human. There is always a selfish element in us. Things change, people change, life change, circumstances change. When things become a blessing to us, do we forget the blessings bestowed upon us? Or do we live with the blessing and bless other people instead and practice equity? So this is definitely a challenge. And on top of this, we are challenged at every turn and corner of our life's journey. Sometimes, our heart is willing, we want to be equitable. Our mind may not be, our flesh may not be. So therefore, it is something that we have to think about. We may succumb to our own weaknesses if the mindset, the values we possess are not strong enough. The last item, inclusion. For this, I shall focus on people with special needs and especially on somebody very close to me, my nephew. I have a nephew, he is a person with a special needs and uh, he doesn't attend uh, classes like uh, every young children in the normal, normal mainstream schools. He attends schools in the special needs schools. So in Singapore, we are really blessed that there are many helping hands around, organizations and volunteers and people and teachers who are born with this kind heart and kind soul. They are willing to help to lift up people with special needs to get them ready to be part and parcel of the society itself. Now, my nephew attended special needs schools. He has graduated from that special needs school and he is now happily employed in a company, a company that has the heart to create employment for people with special needs. And he now becomes part and parcel of the mainstream of society and he, he, he is also actively contributing to the economy of Singapore. To conclude, is humanity therefore at a crossroad? My answer is it depends on which angle you take. For those who have the selfish attitude, the selfish mindset in them, then diversity, equity, inclusion are something insignificant to them. They will, they will see this as obstacles to achieve higher goals for themselves. For somebody with a caring mind, looking at it from a caring perspective, then the three P's come into play. P for public, that is the government. P for people, P for private organizations. There are many of such in Singapore. They do care, right? They do provide time, energy, and the needed resources to help us to embrace diversity to aspire to practice equity. We are, we are aware that equity is a difficult thing to, to apply in our day-to-day -day life, but at least we need to aspire, aspire to practice that. And also to care for people, especially those with special needs, to be included into the mainstream of society. So what do we do to make diversity, equity, and inclusion work? To me, I see this uh, can be done and effectively if we look into a few areas. Number one is, of course, 
education. Public education, train everybody, open up their mind, let them know that, yes, there is diversity, there is equity, there is inclusion, or rather there's inequity, right? But then all this can be reduced, can be, can be brought to the minimum if we are educated and we learn to embrace all these uh, concepts and also apply them in our daily life. The next thing is, is of course, we want to be able to be people who are, who are able to love, to care and to support each other. To do this, we need to have an open mind. We need to humble ourselves. If we are unable to humble ourselves, it is very, very difficult to say, hey, let's embrace diversity. Let's talk about equity. Let's talk about inclusion. Finally, at the end of the day, ask ourselves, what values can I add? What values can I contribute to the society at large to make life better for people and for ourselves? I shall end with this uh, quotation here. The beautiful thing about today is that you get the choice to make it better than yesterday. I have come to a crossroad now, a crossroad about humanity relating to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I can make a choice. And then whether I will make a choice that is better for me tomorrow or not, it is up to me and it is up to how I'm being brought up, it is up to my values. Thank you very much. I very often wonder, what would life be like had the pandemic not happened in 2020? And when I do that, one question definitely comes to my mind. Would we have been a better race in that case? Unfortunately, I always draw up the same answer. No. Agreed, this pandemic brought about an unfathomable proportion of loss, failure, and even death. But that was not all. We did get a couple of lessons from this pandemic. I personally think we learned more about humanity itself. The first lesson I personally learned was that this pandemic exposed the gaping hole, the disparity that was so apparent in our society, the inequality that was there. It was a mere reflection of what was happening. How else do you explain the fact that I was sitting there safely in my cocoon while another woman of my age had to venture out, choose death over hunger in order to put food on her children's plate. How do you explain the fact that while I sat safely in my cocoon, a man had to walk bare feet 800 kilometers to get back to his hometown because he knew had he stayed back in that city and if he got infected, he didn't stand a chance. How do you explain the fact that while I sat safely in my cocoon with access to the digital world, a girl, a young girl in the adjacent state committed suicide because she was heartbroken that her family couldn't afford a smartphone for her education. What do you call this inequality? The virus affected us equally. That virus saw us equally where we couldn't. We are divided by our race, our ethnicity, our geography, our opinions. But it is time to bring us together. It is time to see that as humanity, we are not at a crossroad, not a mere crossroad. We actually have only one path left, the right path. To be honest, when the pandemic first hit us, I thought it was just a phase. You know, we will get over it. Like everything else, things will be fine and we can go about our jobs. The first lockdown happened. The second lockdown happened. The third lockdown happened, and that is when this thick skull realized that this was going to change all our lives, no matter what, you like it or not. And change, yes, it did. Some of us need a nudge, some of us need a push. I needed a pandemic to change, unfortunate but true. And in fact, that change happened when the pandemic came knocking on my door. 
It affected the people around me, the businesses that were happening near my house closed down. The people who gave me my morning smiles and asked me, how are you? How's your dad? Were no longer there. They had either perished or gone back home for good or the lack of livelihood. How do you explain this inequality? And that is when I realized I didn't have a choice. None of us had a choice. We were merely living in the illusion that we had a choice. We simply don't have a choice. In our race for technical advancements, in our race to conquer everything around us, we have left the only thing that gave us the right to call ourselves humans, our humanity. How dare we do that? So today, I stand here as a changed person to whatever degree. And I believe that change, the capacity to change exists in each and every one of us. That was the other lesson the pandemic taught me. Given a chance, every man is capable of change. How else do you explain the fact that I no longer sit in the comfort of my house, but venture out to take up financial responsibility for those who cannot to whatever extent I can. How do you explain the fact that I no longer sit in the comfort of my home, but step out to collect digital devices, get them repaired and hand it over to underprivileged children so that every child has access to education in my sphere of influence? How do you explain the fact that there are billions of people like me doing much more than I could ever think of in their sphere of influence? medically, monetarily, giving a stage like this one to talk about what we think, our ideas, giving power to our thoughts, giving power to the disparities we've seen, giving way, giving hope to the inequality to perish. So ladies and gentlemen, I just have one pledge for all of you. Please choose inclusivity over indulgence. Kindness over comfort and more importantly, humanity over mere success, because there is no other way for us. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Netra and I'm your chief flight attendant. On behalf of Captain Z and the entire crew, welcome aboard Singapore's flight WSD. My first job was an, uh, of that of an air hostess, and I felt very excited about the glamorous life that lay ahead of me. The uniform, makeup, meeting, celebrities was all I could think of. So with all the enthusiasm, I went for my first flight. Though I was very nervous and uh, lost, unaware of what was expected out of me, I did notice that there was something about the way some passengers treated the crew, and it was not acceptable. It would range from ordering me to put their luggage into the lockers, calling me by snapping their fingers, or by not making eye contact. Initially, I took it personally. I thought there was something wrong with me. But when I came across passengers who were extremely polite and friendly with me, I realized that it wasn't me. It was my profession. Somehow, people in the service industry are looked down upon. If someone is there to provide some service, they're seen as servants. And the culture all around the world is that servants are not to be treated equally. Aren't they helping us? Shouldn't we be grateful to them? Shouldn't we respect them more than anyone else? In India, we have domestic help in almost every household. They cook, clean, manage the house for us. But still in most houses, they're not allowed to sit on the fancy sofas and chairs, but given some broken or old piece of furniture to sit away from everyone in one corner. They have separate utensils, the not so nice ones, or maybe the chipped ones. That's what 
happens to the broken crockery, it's kept aside for the domestic help. If the food is rotting in the fridge, it is not thrown out, but given to the domestic help, as their digestive systems are somehow stronger. As I have served as a servant in the air, I do feel more strongly about this. I can empathize easily with the service providers everywhere I go. The waiters, the cab drivers, the delivery guys. Why are some jobs considered more respectful than others? Everyone is doing something to earn a living, right? When we call a friend or a friend's friend comes over to deliver something to a house, we call him in, we welcome him, offer him a glass of water. What do we do when a delivery boy comes? We bang the door on his face after taking the parcel. They are humans too, right? We get a call from customer care or, promotion, or a promotional call. We hang up. How does it feel when someone hangs up the phone on you? Not nice, right? The person is only doing his or her job. Every human being is a creation of God and needs an equal amount of respect. Discrimination comes in different ways. Status, religion, minorities, gender, intelligence, personality, you name it. As humans, the first thing we are responsible for is to be fair to other humans. We are moving way too fast with technology and advancement. We need to take a pause and see whether we are losing our humanity in the process. You are as loving as you think you are. You are as caring as you think you are. Life is for endless love and for care. Life is for joy and happiness to share. Life is to appreciate and see beauty. Life is to love and help humanity. Thank you so much. Yesterday, I had a dream that I became a Neanderthal. Neanderthal. It's a kind of human species that lived around 4,000 years ago. And then in my dreams, I found my body structure, my pleasing smile, my beautiful eyes, and my perfectly aligned teeth got converted into a crooked structure which is similar as that of a monkey. And then I noticed a kind of species around me which is different from me. So I asked, who are you? We are homo sapiens. Homo sapiens? What is this? We are a kind of human species which is much smarter, clever, intelligent and wiser than you. And you must know that if you want to survive further, you have to join our race. These words scared me. And in order to let my species to go further, in order to survive, I join their tribe. And from there on, I set myself on a new journey towards evolution. A kind of evolution which is more inclined towards dominance, hatred, anger, envy, and what not. Then I further found that these wise Homo sapiens divided themselves into tribes, communities, continents, countries, and eventually into races, religions, classes. They even forgot their intelligence, their wisdom, their smartness, 
which they were boasting of. They don't only lose this, they even forgot about their divine intelligence, their true powers, their potential. They totally indulged themselves into wars, building nuclear weapons, accumulating wealth, and killing each other mercilessly. My dream didn't end here. They even, they even started harming Mother Nature, bringing tsunami, earthquakes, landslides, global warming, and then COVID-19. And then suddenly, my son woke me up, Mommy, Mommy, just wake up. It's a great news. It's time to rejoice. Why, what happened? You know, scientists have invented vaccination and now we can live our dream life once more. We can move out. Oh, that's really a good news. Yes, but now I hope you would enroll me for that artificial intelligence course. Artificial intelligence course? Why do you want to go for such courses? When you know that you have enough divine intelligence, you have true powers to create wonders in the world, you can do anything in it. But mommy, you should know that artificial intelligence is the future. And if I, if I will not learn it, I may not survive further. His words again took me back to my dream. Where Homo sapiens were asking Neanderthal to join their tribe if they want to survive further. Here I arise a question. What are we doing? Are we moving towards evolution or extinction? In this pursuit of becoming an advanced homo sapien, we have not only destroyed our external but our internal realm as well. I appreciate, I appreciate that we grew in intelligence, but have we ever estimated what we have lost? I appreciate that we are capable of putting our ideas into reality. But is it worth achieving? I appreciate that we are just a click away from each other. But do we want this click or personal touch? I appreciate that I am able to speak on this forum from one of the parts, one, from one part of the country, from, from the world. But is it worth speaking? At the cost of environmental impairment? I think no. And it says that with our further evolution, such kind of destruction will happen in the world after every five to ten years because this new race of tech sapiens is on a new journey to conquer the entire cosmos using coding, programming, artificial intelligence data science, and up to a point where Google will become our true God. I appreciate that we, that we proved ourselves as the best living being on this earth. But every time, every time we put humanity at a crossroad, we put humanity at a stake. We were at a crossroads when Neanderthals were asked to join homo, so homo sapiens. We were at a crossroad when it was industrial revolution, when it was scientific revolution. And today also we are at a crossroad when we are moving towards technological advancement. And you know why we are doing all these things? Because we want to keep ourselves happy. I ask this question, we have done enough of advancement and we are moving towards another revolution. But are we happy? Are we really, really happy? Just ask this question and then move towards evolution or ask, are we moving towards evolution or extinction? Thank you so much.
Good evening, everyone. On the occasion of World Speech Day, I, Hema Kripalani from Singapore, welcome one and all. The topic of my speech is show care and concern for our planet Earth. Humanity and all life on Earth is now at crossroads. Human population has now crossed 7.5 billion. In about 200 years, human population has grown from 1 billion to 7.5 billion. Population pressure, poverty is ever increasing. Animal species are getting decimated at faster pace and environment is under severe stress. We all have heard about global warming, climate change, glaciers are disappearing, sea levels are rising, small island countries are getting submerged. It is not science fiction, it is for real. Yet, we all continue to ignore and continue as if everything is all right. Humanity is now finding itself facing a momentous global environmental crisis. We need to act now to address environmental issues before it is too late. Once the forces of nature are unleashed, it will be irreversible and destruction that will follow is unimaginable. We need to choose now between the continuation of present model of economic growth with potentially catastrophic results or choose a new developmental model which focuses on reducing poverty while enhancing sustainability, social inclusion and equity. Choices asked to make. It is now wrecking and anything but easy. And the outcome is profoundly uncertain. Humans are consuming far more resources than one Earth can provide unless we change course radically. The consequences will be dire, affecting the habitability of life on Earth. Many countries now possess enough nuclear weapons to destroy Earth many times over. Does Earth need to be destroyed three times or five times? Once is enough. We do not need nuclear weapons to do the job. If we continue at current pace, we will eventually reach the point of no return very soon. Now is the time we started to show care and concern for our planet Earth. We have only one Earth to live on. Million other planets in other galaxies have no meaning to species on Earth, at least not for coming hundred years. Maybe by 2050 or, or by 2070, humans might start going to space, but still, planet Earth cannot be replaced. 99.99% of human and other species will continue to live on Earth. Once again, I want to emphasize planet Earth cannot be replaced. For me, my home in Singapore cannot be replaced which I have built with love, care and concern. I will briefly speak on Singapore model. When Singapore gained independence in 1965, national survival was at stake. With small area of about 581 square kilometer and no natural resources, not even drinking water for its people. Singapore leaders clearly understood growth cannot be done at the expense of environment or citizens' quality of life. Environmental protection went hand in hand with economic growth. Vision shown by Singapore leaders is praiseworthy. They have shown the world to develop and become economic power hubs without compromising on the environment. Maintaining clean and green Singapore has paid handsome dividend to Singapore. As Singapore founding father, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew said greening Singapore was the best project he undertook. 
people want to come and stay and settle down in green Singapore. Environment is degrading rapidly. Biodiversity loss is happening at unprecedented scale, making it easy for spread of diseases from animals to humans like coronavirus, which has happened in 2020. We still are struggling to contain it. All is not yet lost. Mother Earth has shown, given time and reduction in human activity, it can regenerate itself to a healthy state. Air, the world over had cleared in few days of lockdown. Birds started chirping again. Dolphins have started playing in rivers which they never visited during last 40 years. Mother Earth has a remarkable ability to rebalance itself. All this happened due to reduction of human activity. Governments world over need to come together and collaborate to develop sustainable model which rely less on oil guzzlers and more on natural solar energy to fulfill our energy needs. We human need to transform and reduce our activities in number of areas. We need to conserve the forest and plant more trees, practice sustainable agriculture and fisheries, protect biodiversity. All species exist for reason in ecosystem. Protect natural resources, including glaciers, which provide fresh water to all of us in Asia. Adopt clean and green energy, reduce and phase out fossil fuel use. This is not a full list. But these are areas which we need to work on immediately. Individually, as well, we need to do our part. Consume less plastic products. Use less of disposable products. Buy energy efficient appliances. List is endless. I would like to end my speech by requesting one and all to rise to occasion and on this World Speech Day to take pledge to protect our environment. Do it not for others, but for our own selves, for loved ones, for our family. Let's make this World Speech Day to World Action Day by adopting three R's in life. Reduce, reuse, and recycle all resources. Thank you so much. Imagine all our five fingers having the same shape and same size. How the world would be? Would there be beautiful paintings, portraits of different shapes and sizes? We need diversity to flourish. We need differences to increase patience and accept the gifts of God for us. According to Oxford English Dictionary, diversity is the existence of different things in terms of people, economic status, social status, and so on. And including it is mandatory for the nation to grow. This is the state of diversity in our life too. I feel that the concept of diversity should be inculcated, inculcated in our daily lives since childhood. If our family teaches us how to inculcate diversity, how to be inclusive and respectful and acceptable for diversity in our lives, 50% of world's population, 50% of world's problems will come to an end. Every family is composed of different and diverse individuals, be it in their interests, their needs, looks, everything. And I have personally seen many homes breaking because of non-acceptance of diversity. When we hear of the word diversity, the usual things that comes to our mind is diversity in terms of race, caste, or economic status. But nobody pays attention that diversity actually starts from family. In the, according to world data, 
divorce rates has increased to 54% in 2020. And out of this 54%, only 35% is due to diversity and not because of infidelity or any other reasons. Good evening, fellow friends. This is Kathavachak Khushbu, founder, director, and a storyteller and a drama educator of Now Just Tales from Rajasthan, India. And today I would like to share a story where I would like your attention to draw on how diversity affects our life, our mindset. And actually, the concept of diversity and inclusion and acceptance begins, stems from family. This is a story about a 28-year-old woman called Mehek. Mehek was a very happy-go-lucky girl, and she was blessed with every good things in life. A very good husband, a good job, secured life, cars, luxury, everything possible. One week, she came to know that her father-in-law is coming to visit her. She was really excited. And she was getting ready. She laid the whole table. She knew that her father-in-law is coming to stay with them for a week's time. Her father-in-law was an independent, confident, strong, and a well-accomplished man who had a big garden, a big tea estate in one part of India where he was having enough money for himself. And Mehek was really eager to meet her father-in-law because it was her first one-on-one -on -one meeting after wedding. She laid the dinner table with sparkling white linen, the gleaming crockery with golden dream and sparkling white cutlery. Her love was visible in the aroma of the food and everything was perfect. Suddenly, there was a ring at the door. Ding dong! She was excited, she reached, she opened the door and she greeted her father-in-law with a namaste. Her father-in-law didn't say anything. He just blessed her and his vibe and his love was evident with that caress. Mehek knew everything. Nothing was kept under the wraps from her. She knew that her father-in-law has undergone a rare treatment of cancer for tongue and he has undergone chemotherapy. They all sat on the dining table. His father, her father-in-law took just one tablespoon of curry and half chapati, the Indian flatbread. And he took one pinch of the curry and a very tiny bite of the bread and he put inside his mouth. <laughs> Mehek was surprised to see him eating like this. Mehek knew everything. It was not that she was kept under the dark. She knew he had tongue cancer and this, has, this is happening because of his chemotherapy. After the dinner, Mehek went inside her bedroom. She couldn't resist, but she asked her husband, Vivek, why he eats like this? And Vivek just explained to her that it's okay, it's because of the tongue cancer, the operation, the chemotherapy that he has undergone. And all this has led to his tongue like this because of which he takes at least an hour to eat only half chapati and one tablespoon of curry. Don't worry so much, he will go away in a week. He can't live any other city. He loves his tea garden, he loves his tea estate. <laughs> And Vivek went off to sleep. Mehek too tried to went sleep, but she was lost in her dreams. She was lost in her thoughts. Her thoughts were not helping her to sleep. She just thought 
that why such a good and a nice and a loving man is suffering from cancer? Why is he living life like this? Why he's suffering? Why? He is blessed with all the good things in life. He has so much of money, but still he can't eat more than one tablespoon of curry in half chapati. A pinch of curry will burn his throat. It is so difficult to see him eat like this. Why is he suffering? Is it a result of his karma? My mother always used to say that every man enjoys the fruit of his karma. Is he behaving like this because he must have done something wrong in his life, in his past lives? Why is he suffering? Oh, come on, heck, you're overthinking, you're overjudgmental. Just go off to sleep. And next morning, Mehak and her husband tried their best to be with their father-in-law. And her father-in-law loved and had good fun with them. The whole week, all three of them enjoyed each other's company. But every time at the dining table, Mehak couldn't Stop thinking, why is he suffering? Because every time at the dining table, the same incident were repeating. Be it in the morning, be it in the afternoon, or in the evening, or at dinner time. One day, when Mehik knew that tomorrow, his father, her father-in-law is going back, she sat with her diary. She started writing as to why is he suffering? She couldn't stop the dilemma. Why is he suffering? How can I help him? He's living all alone in Assam with his staff. Yes, he has all money. He's confident. He's strong. He doesn't need us, nor he's asking our support. But is it good to be living all alone? His wife left him and ran away with the man. And his only son is living miles away from him for his job. Is it a right way to leave him over there all alone? Yes, he's not asking for it. Nor my husband Vivek is asking me to have him over here. But is it correct to leave him all over there? But if I ask him to live here with us over here, will I be able to accept him the way he is? Will I be able to See him eating like this every day, four times a day? Will I be able to accept tomorrow when a child will come? What will I show it to him? But again, doesn't he deserve love? After all, love is the solution for all. Love and compassion is the solution for all. Don't you think? What should I do? What should I do? Anyways, I think I should sleep. And with that thought, Mehek went off to sleep. Next morning, Mehek was helping her father-in-law to pack the suitcase. And when he was leaving and he was just hugging his son, Mehek came and asked him, Father, please stay with us. We would love to have you over here. And her father-in-law said, of course, I will. And with that thought, her father-in-law came back after a week and he started living with them. This is a happy story, a story where there is diversity and the character has accepted the diversity of her father-in-law. But what if she wouldn't have accepted it? What if she would have a child and what that child would have seen? That the family itself is not accepting a person with so much of diversity due to whatever physical ailment. With that note, I would like all of you to think and consider. Don't you agree with me that diversity, acceptance, and love starts, stems from family. And if you believe in that, if you feel that 
the first lesson of acceptance of diversity starts at home then do do follow this principle at home be it your family members or your children thank you over to you Hello, my name is Ruchina Ballinger and I live in Bali, Indonesia, and I am the project director for Ami Sawaka Desa Las Community Center. This is a vocational training center that is located in North Bali that uh, the Ami Corps Community Foundation is sponsoring, is, is, is paying for, and this is to help the people in this very small fishing village with a lot of impoverished people try and give uh the next generation some tools so they will be able to pull themselves out of poverty and so this center is focusing on four different principles the first is permaculture which is a form of organic gardening Lus is a village that is on the other side of the rain the rain shadow on the other on the north side of the mountains in bali so it's extremely dry and water is at a premium so using this type of um uh, uh permaculture organic gardening they don't need to use as much water so we'll have 15 ara 1500 square meters of gardening and then we'll have 1500 square meters of a, of a building which is it's like a school but it's a vocational training center that will have a five-star training kitchen a small restaurant 10 classrooms a computer lab a library and a meeting hall and then a large round rotunda where meetings can be held, performances can be done, and many groups can, can come together. So we're going to have uh, culinary arts being taught along with the, uh, the permaculture. And then the third pillar is called Living Values Education, which is a leadership program. We're working in conjunction with the Karuna Foundation in Bali. And this is a, a, a type of program that is integrated into all of the other aspects of the vocational training center. And in uh, Desa Las, in the village of Las, it's, a, it's, um, it's called the Bali Mula village, which means it's an old traditional village. And so their um, ceremonies are different, though their way of life is different from other parts of Bali. And oftentimes they're considered not as um, uh, kind of up to date as, as their neighbors. And so the the kids here that are in junior high and high school oftentimes feel uh, they don't have a really good sense of self-worth. So one of the um, things that the Living Values Education does is that it, it, it provides them with tools to go into themselves and to um, pull out their strengths. And this will be um, taught to all the students, all the staff, all the teachers, including the security guards, so everybody will be um, will be on, on the same page. And then our fourth pillar is cultural preservation. So once we are up and running, which will be in April of 2022, if uh, we're on schedule, because we're building right now, um, we will uh, be purchasing a gamelan orchestra. Um, it's about 25 instruments, traditional Balinese music, and be teaching the music, traditional music and dance of Bali to the students so they have a sense of pride in their culture as well as then they can take these arts to other parts of Bali and they can perform and they can also um, have a little bit of pocket money from um, from their performances. So these four different areas are going to be integrated. They'll be on campus for one year and then they'll do a six month internship with uh, either at a hotel or at a restaurant or maybe they'll try and and start their own business. We'll be giving them um, English classes. So we're, we're hoping that we'll be able to, to do the second semester completely in English. And we'll be giving them some basic business skills, basic computer skills. Uh, so they'll, uh, they'll be able to go out into the world fully, fully equipped. Um, and so it's a food to table program. So they all will have to learn how to be farmers. Many of them come from farming um, families and then they'll learn how to cook and then they'll learn how to present and then they'll also learn how to present themselves out in the world and so we're hoping that with this program um and and of course right now we're in the middle of 
a pandemic. So it's uh, it's uh, difficult because in Bali, we rely so much on tourism and so many of the hotels and restaurants have had to close. But we're hoping that in a year or two that things will be back to a different different kind of normal, but that things will be open. So we'll be able to partner with a number of hotels and restaurants. We already have a number of partners. We're also partnering with one of the major universities who's helping us with curriculum uh, development. And so I've been living here in Les for six years. I've been living in Indonesia for, uh, for over 40 years, but this is um, uh, this small village is very close to my heart. And I'm really hoping that with our program, we'll be able to bring these young people uh, up to a different a different level of consciousness, environmental um, environmental awareness, and also awareness of themselves. So thank you very much. Om Santi 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 Om. I have lots of friends on Facebook. And when I asked them, what's the difference between equality and equity, one of them sent me this diagram. As you can see in this diagram, what's happening is there are three people trying to see over a fence. And when you give them equality, you give them all the same little box to stand on but the smallest one can't see over the fence but when you give equity you give an extra box to the little one so that he can see over the fence now let's think about this this is what you might call positive discrimination and is it always a good thing one is tends to think yes i mean karl marx came up with the great phrase from each according to his ability and to each according to his need. But then that didn't always work because there were times when in a very big country, the people at the far end of the country didn't get the goods at all. And only the people living in the capital got the distribution of the wealth. And another thing can happen. You can find that meritocracy works well because People find they get the same whether they work or not, so they might as well sit around and do nothing. Well, how does this actually apply in simple terms to real life? Let me give you a couple of examples. I'll give you an example of the maid who worked for a friend of mine. And the maid normally worked seven days, six, five or six days a week. And then she started working on the seventh day. And I was puzzled by this. And I said, why is the maid working on her Sunday, her day off? Now, this is not allowed in Singapore anymore, but in those days it was allowed. And the maid told me the reason was that she had given the money she earned to her oldest son because he went to college and was studying for a qualification which would enable him to get a good job then the other son said to her no you must give me the same amount of money it's not fair not to treat us both equally so to earn the extra money she had to work on her day off and never got a day of rest and I was very disappointed in this I thought this is poor very sad for the poor mother who was working non-stop and never got a day of rest for the benefit of a son who was sitting around doing nothing, lazing about, not getting a job, not getting a qualification, maybe taking drink or drugs. And it didn't seem to be giving him an incentive at all. So was equality right in that case? So we have to decide, is equality always the right thing or is equity the right thing? Maybe equity would not have been giving them equal shares, but saying that if they worked hard, you would reward the ones who worked hardest. Well, of course, let's take another example. We'll take a mother leaving her money when she dies to her two sons. Does she leave equal amounts to both of them? Or maybe her lawyer, her 
advocate, I think they would say in America, her solicitor, we would say in London, England, would ask her, well, who needs the money most? And she might then say, well, I'll give it to my poorest son because he obviously needs the money the most. So here we're, we're not giving equality, we're giving what sounds more like equity to bring them up to an equal point. Then you can see what would happen, how the other son would be outraged and might come across and say, this is ridiculous. My brother, he, he doesn't know what to do with money. He's not good at money at all. He, he, he will just waste it. Whereas I am good with money. Look what I've done with my life and with my money. I'm producing money. I'm employing other people. I'm much more deserving case. I'll make much better use of the money. You should give it to me. Then we could go one further. We could do what my grandmother did. She gave the money to the person. It was actually a, a, the older sister on behalf of the younger son and said, only give it to him when he needs something. Don't just give him money. He'll give it away to somebody else who tells a sob story. He's vulnerable. He's too kind. He will lose all his money. You look after the money and you make sure that he has it for things he needs and doesn't give it to other people. So there again, there's a way of... It's not quite equal because she's giving the money to somebody else to look after. Um, sometimes you hear about this in trust funds for children so they don't get the money until they're older. Then we look at what about inheritance? Should, should everybody be getting the same? We've really talked about this a bit. We can look at what's done in France. In the very old days, the money would, and the land would always be left to the older son. And so in areas where that still takes place, you have a large vineyard all owned by descendants of one branch of the family. Then we have other places where the whole place is divided equally and everyone has a tiny, tiny share, almost not, not economic. And they have to form a cooperative and get together because it's just not economic to grow vines, whether for wine or grapes or anything else when they've got such a, a small holding. So it isn't always as simple as you think. What we want is inclusion in which everybody is included, their views are included and they all benefit from what there is to distribute and they all contribute to creating more to distribute to themselves, to each other, to the whole world and to their own children and grandchildren and the next generation. Isn't that what we all want? With those thoughts, you now know the difference between equity and equality. I hope you've enjoyed this little talk. Good night. Good day, depending on where you are. And if it's good night for you, sleep well. Ah, welcome back. Did you enjoy the speeches from the 13 speakers? Yes. What about you? Oh, fantastic. Ah, that's good. Now we'll go into the second group of speakers. I notice that this is a very familiar group led by uh, Gay Bumping from uh, Agora. Wow. How did you manage to get him to contribute? Well, Gay Bumping, he was a very active Toastmasters. Somehow or rather, he went into Agora and he built Agora in Singapore. That is a credit to Gay Bumping. And many a time he asked me to appear in Agora. So this year I appeared two or three times. Oh, wow. I thought Agora was a very good platform for learning public mm. speaking. Okay. What about you? I, I, find, I find that, uh, you know, he is able to actually assemble uh, speakers from the world. For instance, you know, in this particular group, uh, you know, you got people from uh, USA, you got people from Indonesia, you got people from India. Now, I'm particularly actually impressed, you know, by by two of the speakers. Uh, both are very young, one age 13 and one age 15. Mm. Uh, and uh, so they are uh, one American Chinese, and the other one is uh, American girl. 
So I'm sure uh, viewers is going to enjoy you know, their speeches. Mm, that's good. Let's not wait and let's hear from Grace Waltono. Okay. When someone isn't speaking loud enough, you give them a microphone. But the real question is, how would you get that someone to speak in the first place? Hello everyone, my name is Gracie, and surprise! Today I will be talking about my hero, Mike Nicholson. Now, according to most studies in America, people's number one fear is public speaking, and number two is death. Does that, does that sound right to you? This means that to your average Tom, Dick, and Harry, if you go to a funeral, you're better off in the casket than doing the eulogy. <laughs> now, in case you didn't get that, ladies and gentlemen, in the U.S. of A, a country of predominantly English speakers, public speaking is the number one fear. Now, let me put this into perspective really quickly. Imagine a bucket that is filled to the brim with centipedes. Now, imagine trying to convince a person to stick their hand inside. Now imagine that said person was a 10 year old. Well, can't do it. Centipedes rank number 21 on the list of world fears. And if you can't convince one person to interact with fear number 21, imagine how hard it would be to get people to do fear number one, public speaking. See, Mike Nicholson is my hero because he has managed to do all that yet somehow never says more than he needs to. You know, everywhere around you, you'll hear people call my generation leaders of tomorrow or hope for a better world or future investments or really lots and lots of other pretty names. But pretty names, they don't do anything. Not really. They are just names. And to many people, these sweet nothings will never be anything they take initiative to make reality. These sweet nothings will never be anything more than sweet nothings. You know, Mike has pretty much invented a new term, sweet somethings, because he doesn't say things unless he actually means them. Heck, he'll even tell you all the things you don't think you want to hear too. Bitter somethings, lots and lots of constructive criticism, but always in a way that'll leave you willing to listen. Mike has always treated us with the same respect as adults, but never with the same expectation from adults. He'll never patronize you. He'll never show his seniority over you, but he will always hear you out. He will always value you and always value whatever it is you have to say. Mike Nicholson is someone who treats every single human being he meets with respect. In fact, in all of my four years of speech club, I've never heard Mike call us anything but Agorians. Well, formerly Gavaliers. Never children. Never kiddos. And most certainly never future leaders of tomorrow or anything pretentious like that. To him, all of us were just Agorians. Never more and certainly never less. Now, he's always insisted that Agora was a place where everyone would be free to express themselves. And I didn't realize how deep that that truly extended until we had a bunch of rowdy kids join us one day for a few meetings. And oh man, they used to duck under our tables, used to play with the gavel, used to screech, used to run around. Well, you get the picture. Now, one of them really only ever uttered three coherent words. I'm sure all of you have watched Guardians of the Galaxy, and I'm sure all of you know Groot. For us, it was less, I am Groot, and more, I hate school. I hate school, I hate school. And this was all they'd say when they got up on stage to deliver a table topic or give any introduction at whatsoever. Now, one day, all of us were just sitting around, and for the fifth, maybe sixth or even 19th time, it was the same I hate school routine and ex nobody laughed anymore. What followed after that was an awkward silence. 
followed by more silence. That day I learned that it took four seconds for a silence to become awkward. But then Mike stood up and he said, why do you hate school? And it's really a very simple moment, but I think that that was the moment that I realized that they didn't say they hated school because that was all they talked about or that was all they actually could think about. They probably only did so because they had a lot of strong opinions about school, but had very little way to express themselves. In fact, we found out later on that it wasn't even school they hated. It was the school environment. See, Mike never disciplined them, never raised his voice, never told them to sit down and for God's sake, keep quiet. But he showed them respect and treated them just like he would treat you or I. And eventually they calmed down all on their own and even managed to deliver quite a few speeches during their time with us. Public speaking is indubitably one of the most important skills that anyone could ever have. And everyone is so quick to say that, yes, it's vital to have more youth clubs. Yes, we must raise our children to be able to speak publicly. Yes. We must do this, we must do that, yet there has to be a reason that there's so little of them out there. I think that people tend to underestimate just how difficult running a youth club or any club can be. It isn't always just roses and peaches and cream, and people are so very quick to want their children to emerge suddenly world-class orators, but they tend to forget that at the end of the day, a speech club is supposed to help you express yourself. And that a youth club is, well, just that. A youth club for kids. And us fumbling over words and not knowing what to say and acting up, that's just part and parcel of freedom of expression. In all those four years, Mike has done more for my generation, or for me personally, than any other sweet talking adult, because he never forgot He's always encouraged us to make mistakes, to grow from these mistakes, to try out different things, to be wacky, to dance on stage if that was what we wanted to. Outside of Achievers, he was Michael Nicholson, an HR consultant, an executive coach, founder of Britcham Toastmasters and member of the Indonesian Heritage Society, credits to LinkedIn. But inside the club, he'd always be just Mike. Never more, certainly never less. If you were Picasso and someone handed you a stick man and said, help me grow, how many of us would see the potential in that drawing? Many of us in our youth club start out terrified of public speaking. Most of us start out with less than a stick man to work with. More often than not, we'd mess up on our first or even second sometimes third tries at a prepared speech. In fact, Mike's been lecturing me since my first icebreaker to put down the notes I've been trying. Our club is filled with kids who are all under 18 years old. Kids with smarts, who have lots and lots and lots and lots of things to say, but just don't know how. Some of the kids barely spoke English, but week after week, they keep coming back. Sometimes they didn't, but a lot of them did and they came to speak because someone was always listening. And I personally believe that one of the most genuine, most sincere forms of respect for anyone is actually listening, you know, genuinely listening, not just hearing, to what someone else had to say. And Mike, by listening to what all of us in Achievers Youth, listening to what we had to offer, you've really shown us, shown the world, that it isn't a lack of discipline that's the issue, nor is it a lack of reading or too much screen time or video games. The issue is that not enough people care to listen. We are, all of us, fragments of everyone we meet all around us. And Mike, by taking the time to cultivate this miniature society where everyone listens to everyone, where everyone values everyone's opinions and treats people with respect, you are making the world a better place. Well, you've made the world a better place. As humans, a lot of us learn from example, and you have set such a fine one too. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, when you want to speak louder, you hand someone a microphone. But if you want to get someone to speak, well, I would have thought you'd have guessed that by now. You hand them a mic. Thank you, everyone. Looking back on my life, certain years stand out. For example, 2020. But I'm going to look at two very positive years in my life. 2007 and two, 1972. 1972 actually directly led to 2007, just with a 35-year gap. But the roots of two, 1972 actually go back to 1968, when my parents divorced. And my biological father became Mike, and my future stepdad became dad. Long story, but shortened. In 1968, the end of the year, Apollo 8 flew around the moon, and my brother was very excited, as a seven-year-old would be. And he collected all sorts of newspaper clippings and all sorts of stories from that. And his enthusiasm spread to me, even though I was a three-year-old at the time. <laughs> But fast forward to 1972 and Christmas of that year. In December, early December 72, Apollo 17, the last Apollo mission, flew to the moon and landed two men on it. Eugene Cernan was the commander and the lunar module pilot was Harrison Jack Schmidt. Now, at the time, I was seven. And I'd been bored of Apollo missions like everybody else, and I didn't understand their importance at that time. I could keep myself now because I'm such a space nerd. But next door to my grandma lived a professional geologist. And at the time, he told me all about the fact they were sending a geologist to the moon. Harrison Jack Schmidt was the only professional geologist to land on the moon. And that was very significant. So I became very interested. I watched the, the mission avidly. It was the only Apollo mission to be launched at night. And um, nighttime in America is very early in the, in the morning in England. And my dad, my stepfather, wanted to watch it. And I watched it with him. And then we had school vacation. And my parents took me over to my grandparents' house. And we stayed there until my, my parents came over for actual Christmas. I spent most of the time watching the Apollo mission with my grandma and granddad. And also the geologist from next door uh, would stop around occasionally and tell me what was going on and, you know, uh, get me even more enthused. So Harrison Schmidt became one of my heroes. And on Christmas Eve, my father, my biological father, came over with a bunch of Christmas presents, stuck them under the tree, and that was that. Then late Christmas Eve, there was a panic in the house. All sorts of things going on, all sorts of commotion. And my grandfather had a heart attack. And the parents and my aunt and uncle and my grandma rotated around the house so that the kids there were looked after. There were six kids. There were three cousins and my sister, my brother and I. And it was all full of commotion and everything until really lunchtime on Christmas morning, Christmas Day, when the parents decided to let grandfather have a rest at hospital. They all came home. Somehow they cooked a turkey. I can't remember the details. So we all sat down at Christmas dinner, had turkey, stuffing the works. And then it was present time. And underneath the tree amongst Santa's presents and presents from my aunt and uncle and my cousins and stuff, with the presents from my father. And one of them was a book, a very large rectangular book called Challenge of the Stars. And it was written by Sir Patrick Moore, who, if you're English, is very, very famous. He's an astronomer, but he was an astronomer. And he was very common to the everyday people. He was very, very eccentric and um, well loved by everybody. And the artist was a guy called David Hardy, who I'd never heard of. 
But I went through that book page by page by page by page, memorized it and everything. I love the book. I love the artwork. So that was 1972. Fast forward to 2007. And if you recall my last speech about Elon Musk, I did a presentation at the Mars conference of 2007. When I got approval to do the speech, I knew exactly what I wanted to talk about. It was to talk about why America had to go back to the moon and urgently. And it was based on a book that I'd written, I'd written, I'd read by Harrison Schmidt, the astronaut. And it was all about the need to go back to the moon because of helium three. Now, I won't go too much into the technicalities, but on the surface of the moon is a thing, substance called helium-3, which is created by sunlight hitting the moon's surface and turning the regolith into mysterious compounds. If you do nuclear fusion using helium-3, the byproducts are water and energy, no radiation. But nobody's successfully done helium-3 fusion yet. But it will be done because there's a determination to do it. So my whole speech was about trying to inspire people to go back to the moon to get the helium three before China, Russia, or anybody else did to keep the Americans ahead. So I found out one day after I got approval for the speech that Harrison Schmidt was an adjunct professor at the University of Wisconsin. So what do you do? Find out where one of your heroes is. Ring, 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 ring. Hello, is that the engineering department of Wisconsin University? Yes, okay. Uh, is Professor Smith in by any chance? No, oh, he's on summer break, okay. No problem. Oh, really? You can give me his home email address? Really? Okay, that's great, thank you very much. Scribble, scribble, scribble. I noted down the home email address of Dr. Schmidt. Composing an email to him, asking him to use references from the book, photographs of him on the moon, and other such things, and click send. At the same time, I was already friends with David Hardy on Facebook because he was very, very public about talking about space art and science fiction art. So, out of the book, Challenge of the Stars, was pictures of moon colonies and also the first landings on mars which was supposed to take place in the 1980s so i got hold of david on facebook and i said david could i possibly use some of your pictures out of the book and i'll give you credits and stuff in my speech there he is chatting back to me oh yes yeah, certainly david no problem no problem all the ones you want he said by the way if you look at the picture of mars that i did back in 1972 can you notice something funny? I'm being a Mars person that I am. I looked at the pictures very carefully and I was like, no, no, it all looks good. He said, well, the skies are blue. We now know the skies are actually pink on Mars. Didn't then, but we do now. I was like, oh, okay, that's good. So, So I got his permission too. And I contacted one of the scientists called Caroline Porco, who is absolutely an amazing scientist. She, did, she was head of imagery of the Cassini mission. She was also involved in Voyager and other things as well. And that was all before lunchtime on a Friday afternoon, Friday morning rather. And lo and behold, by one o'clock in the afternoon, I had replies from Dr. Schmidt and Dr. Porco both give me permission to use their work in my speech. Talk about a thrill. Oh my God. You contacted three of your heroes in one day and they all said, yeah, go ahead, David, use my stuff. Absolutely amazing. So I prepared the speech, did the speech 14 times to get ready for the conference. I wanted to nail this thing. Did the speech in front of about 25 people. Oh, that was a small crowd, but there we go. And loved it loved every minute of it and the next day is when i got to meet elon musk so what i learned from that is that if you have heroes just be brave 
reach out to them. They're human beings just like you and I. And if you actually communicate with them and say, I love your work, I've been following what you're doing, can I use some of your stuff in my work? Chances are they'll say yes. Three out of three so far. So 1972 had its bad parts, but it had its good parts as well. 2007 changed everything. Thank you, everybody. Keep your eyes open and take a look around you, around all the things that surround you. Analyze every particle that you can see. Notice the perfection of the world of every detail that outlines it. Try to search for a reason of happiness, for a reason that still keeps you alive. You haven't found it yet, but it's right in front of you. I guess you just can't see it. But the reason is there in every second of your life in every decision that you make. Look a bit closer. Look in the within and maybe you will find it. But if you didn't find it even then, maybe you are just too close. We spend every day looking for an example, for an ideal personality or to put it simply, for a hero. But unfortunately, all this time, we've been so blind. We've been covered in a fake reality that made us thought that we are unimportant and forgotten, that we are nothing to the world, that we are useless and weak. But is this the real truth? Are we like this, or we just seem to be? Take a look at the patterns that they give us, full of plastic, synthetic, but not genuine and real. And those are the heroes that they want us to think they're perfect and unstoppable. But guess what? They are not. Those are just some marionettes that they use to control us. And it seems like they have already done it. So basically, their mission has been accomplished. But in fact, who is a real hero? Who is that person who makes you feel special? Who makes you feel that finally you mean something? And you're not just another human in this uncontrollable world. For example, imagine yourself hanging by a rock over an abyss. Do you think in that moment your superhero will come and will save you? <laughs> no, of course not. Because the only one who can do that and will ever do it is yourself because you are the only hero here in this huge world you are the only one who really cares about yourself you are the only one who can save you but you know it's a pity that you can't still feel it you know it but you can't use it. In conclusion, looking for a lasting soul that is supposed to free you from this world in every hard moment will make you even weaker and smaller. So trying to find a pattern for your perfect hero is just useless and will ever be because it doesn't need superpowers or any special characteristics to make you understand that the only one who is capable of anything is you. 
And maybe, at some point, you will be able to realize it too. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm an old man, just touching 80. And I would like to share with you some insights about how to live a healthy life, a holistic life with good mental health. First thing is that, you know, I realize many of these, you know, uh, insights over the last few years of my life. Number one, we, I have to be more authentic in my life, especially when we are living in a world, in a broken world full of fake news, full of fake information, that we find it very hard to live a decent life because we are always afraid of what other people may talk about us or gossip about us or say things behind our back or look down on us and ridicule us. So, you know, it is impossible to live an, an authentic life if we are, you know, bothered by such things. To live an authentic life is to live a life without denial or rationalization. And of course, it takes courage to live an authentic, authentic, authentic life. You know, it takes a lot of courage, of course. And especially, we know not too long ago, probably about a year or two ago, we have, sorry, some problem. Oh, sorry. So for me, it takes great courage to live a fulfilling life, especially if I want to go after my dream. For me, if I want to dream, for an old man, I may as well dream big. I don't believe in dreaming little dreams because it is only the big dreams that will excite my blood. And it's exciting dreams that can enhance the longevity of my life. Small dreams make, it, make life very boring. So dreams are always exciting because if you want to dream your life, you will live your life in the future. Dreams are not, not, not built in the past. It's always built in the future. It's awaiting to be manifested in the future. So because of this, I find that, you know, if I dream exciting dreams, I can live longer because my exciting dreams will pull me into the future. And then in addition to this, you know, great dreams are powered by unconditional love and acceptance. Sorry about, I mean, they're having some, I've got some problem with my computer because, you know, some of these fake things coming into my view to block, block my screen. Sorry about that. Anyway, my, for me, my great dreams are always powered by unconditional love and acceptance. You know, unconditional love and acceptance is important philosophy for me, especially over the past few, past five years. I try to live my life intentionally with unconditional love. Uh, one of my dreams was to realize last year when I started my Facebook blog on depression prevention and management. I call it recast depression into happiness. And it took a lot of courage for me to do this, uh, do this post because number one, I'm not a psych psychologist or a psychiatrist or a doctor. And to you know, put up a postings on depression is very, very controversial and very, very scary because you can do something wrong, say something, and you can people can sue me, you see? And yeah, that kind of thing. It is not a simple thing, but whatever it is, somehow or other, I did it for uh, for one and a half years with 210 members, and there are thousands of postings inside there. Every day I've been putting up something 
based on my own experience related with depression, as well as based on my reading on psychotherapy, as well as, you know, based on creative techniques, because I'm an author of a book, you see, Cultivating Your Creativity. So I always believe in, uh, in having a creative mindset to tackle uh, difficult problems, challenging problems, especially when you can't find the answers outside. You have to depend on your creativity to look for good answers, good solutions. So that's what I've been doing for this one and a half years, putting up quite a lot of thousands of postings inside there. And I believe some of them could be helpful to my friends and relatives because I find, I mean, I found that they are coming back every day to look at my post, which is very encouraging. Then also, I have been practicing unconditional love last year when I was looking after my sick wife, my terminally sick wife for nearly two years. During the time, it was very difficult. I find it's very, very taxing. Until I changed my mindset that I must look after her with unconditional love. No condition whatsoever. When I changed my mindset, things became very different. Somehow or other, I find I, I began to get new, you know, new energies, new sources of energies, and uh, a new meaning and purpose in looking after her. Just imagine, I normally you find that you know, for my wife, because she's terminally sick, she cough a lot and she couldn't sleep because of the cough. Sometimes in about two or three o'clock at night, I would more or less, I would do foot reflexology for her. I sleep, I sleep the other way around with my head the other way so that I can face her feet and I will rub her feet for half an hour until she goes to sleep. And I even try to practice Qigong, even though I'm a Qigong amateur. Some I've learned something about Qigong. That actually it's possible to generate healing energies in your fingertips. And with that, I've been more or less, you know, you know, you know, scrolling my, my uh, scanning my fingers over my 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 wife's chest. And I find that after half an hour, she go off to sleep. She went off to sleep very nicely until morning, which I found was amazing. How come this, you know, all these healing powers are given to me? It's a mystery anyway. Anyway, so I want to say that, you know, by practicing unconditional love with my wife, huh, I find that after the death of my wife, my children, they were much more appreciative. We were closer, you know, our relation was much better because every time, whenever my wife spoke to my children, she would remind them, So the day of their father, excuse me. Anyway, that is her way of expressing love for me, you see. Always remind the children, look after the father. So, sorry about that. Every time I talk about this, you know, I can't control my emotion. And more importantly, by practicing unconditional love with my Burmese mate, you know, my Burmese mate looked after my wife. After, you know, my wife passed away, she continued to stay with me. And when, I, when my mate's house was burned down, we tried to help her to build the house. And now that, you know, now that, you know, she, the, the mates, Family was in problem because of the martial law, the military rule in Burma. Uh, we continue to look after her. I continue to look after her. So this is a kind of unconditional love. And I find that strangely, when we practice unconditional love, there are somehow or others certain mysterious positive energies are attracted to in my life. One of which is good luck, for example. I mean, very strangely, you know, some positive energy will come and you get more or less when they say money don't fall from the sky, money do fall from the sky in a different form. I, I tell you that, but anyway, I'm not going to talk about that because it sounds too incredible to believe. 
just to just to let you know that if you practice unconditional love, there are all kinds of benefit we will get in our life. You know, number one is of course more healthy lifestyle, more peace of mind, more better inter interpersonal relationship, and then more uh, more wholesome self esteem. I found that you know. I could respect myself much better because I practice unconditional love. That I found that I have more or less, I'm living more or less the best version of myself. And I can look at the mirror every morning and say that, well done, Mr. Kong. You are certainly my best friend. You are certainly my hero. I, I admire you. And I can tell that to myself, which is very, very good. And that is one of the best. According to the English Cambridge, um, the Cambridge English Dictionary, a hero is someone who is admired for their courage, outstanding achievements, or noble qualities. There are many heroes in this world. Heroes save people and help fight off villains or do real jobs. Some may include superheroes such as the Black Panther and Iron Man, or others may be good Samaritans and frontline workers like nurses and doctors during the COVID-19 period. Some heroes may even be celebrities like Cristiano Ronaldo, who donated millions of his hard-earned dollars to several charities, and Oprah Winfrey, who had made the Oprah Winfrey Scholars Program, which gives scholarships to students determined to use their education to give back to their communities in the United States and abroad. However, my hero is a little different. He was a wise old man who played a big, big part in my early life. He is my grandfather, who had passed away last year from cancer. My grandfather was born in 1936 in China's southern province of Guangdong. He was an only child. I was brought up by his grandmother. He had two sons, and one of them is my father. He has something that a few people have, a wisdom of the times. He was a dedicated geologist, and through his travels, he decided from a young age that the world would belong to the future generation. And despite all the hardships, the whole family migrated to Hong Kong. During those days, Hong Kong under the British rule was dominated by the English language. However, he was a true professional in his field. Language was the major barrier, and being unable to speak or write English, he could only work as a laborer and waiter in restaurants for minimum income. Times were hard for him during those colonial days, and he even worked up to four jobs in one day. He even had to borrow money from relatives to buy a tiny flat of 400 square feet of, on the eighth floor of an old building with narrow unlit staircase. His hardship drove him to work hard to, both, to send both his sons to the UK to study English even if it meant a distance of almost 6,000 miles apart for a few years. It must have been a heartbreaking decision for him back then. My grandfather often told me stories about stones. It was his only passion, being a geologist, and he traveled all over China looking for oil wells. When I was little, he used to show me colorful pictures of what kinds of stones. It was only then when I was older, then I found out what they were. He had a fantastic memory of their names, origin and locality of different types of stones. He was simply awesome. Grandfather loved books, he would spend hours reading and often I would sit in his lap and he would read to me. Although I never did fully understand most what the books were about because well, they were all in Chinese of course. His calm and soothing voice always had a hold over me, and I'll enjoy peaceful sleep. Later, when the iPad was invented, it was now my turn to show what grandfather, what the digital world looks like. We had a fun, we had a lot of fun watching all kinds of interesting documentaries and movies for hours on end. We had great fun together. Grandfather doted on me a lot and took me everywhere in my little pram when I was born and when I could walk. He'd often play cat and mouse in the playground. He would take lots of photos and videos with his old camera and watch them over and over again. He said they would keep him company whenever I was not around. My days will full of laughter and joy, 
whenever grandfather was around. I was carefree, and he had always encouraged me to go beyond my abilities. One thing I learned from my grandfather was his positive outlook. He had a quiet nature and was always smiling. Stars were always sparkling in his genial brown eyes, just as he regarded me at his crown jewel. He, in turn, was my blue moon diamond. I had never heard, or, never heard a harsh word from him and always comforted me with encouraging words whenever I was disappointed or unhappy when I got bad marks in school. He helped me with my Chinese and calligraphy and even, and even taught me Chinese. He had a great influ influence in my young life, and even when he had a stroke and could not walk properly, he remained positive in his own way, often encouraging me in my studies. I felt really sad when I had to leave him to study in UK, but he was very supportive, and we often communicated through WeChat whenever we had time. I was devastated when my parents told me one day that he had passed away. <laughs> And devastated when my parents told me one day that he had passed away and we could not attend his funeral due to the COVID pandemic. Although he was very old and sickly, he had never once mentioned about his illness. News of his death made me very depressed and sorrowful for a long time. However, he had made me stronger mentally and emotionally and made me want to go forward in life. He was the one who took me this far. My grandfather's perse perseverance in his illness opened my eyes and made me realize that my grandfather showed qualities not many people have. He had the strength and courage that I do not see in many people. He is my hero because of who he is. Every time when I wanted to give up on something, no matter whether it was big or small, I would think of him and I would be driven to finish what I had started. He encouraged me to follow my dreams and be successful in whatever I do. He's the best person I could ever think of that has walked on this earth. Thank you very much for listening to my speech. You have not achieved your target. You can't even build a successful product. You can't lead a team. You are fired. Imagine if someone told you this. What would you do? Would you blame your boss? Or would you? Meeting leader, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Our mind is so powerful. It works 24 by 7. Till the time we enter an examination hall. They asked me questions I didn't know. What did I do? I gave them answers which they did not know. In my school, if you ask them about Raju 35, they will only tell you, oh yeah, how can we forget him? As a child, I was so talented. None of my classmates or even my teachers could come close. That was for reading my handwriting. The teachers had to go through agony in correcting my answer sheet. So what they did, they thought to themselves, never trouble the trouble because the trouble will trouble you. So what they did, they just put 35 pass mark so that next year, some other teacher has to go through that painful experience. In our township, rank in an entrance examination means everything. I adopted the strategy of guessing the answer and hoping it's right. When the results came in, my mother was seen from the top and me from the bottom. Pretty soon, I could find my number. I looked into my mother's eyes. The pain and agony I remember till this very date. She stopped talking to me. The loneliness and long nights of despair rattled the very bones of my body. I felt like an empty shell, an empty shell. My guess and hope has been her pain and agony. Her belief in me 
was shattered. Do you remember a situation where someone believed in you, but you did not have the belief in yourself? I spent sleepless nights. End of the day, mothers are mothers. She held my hand and said, son, can you do something for me? No problem, mom, as long as you keep speaking to me. Can you promise me that from today onwards, you will have a belief in you that you will excel in studies? I said, I swear, I will do it. Once I started believing in myself, plethora of possibilities started pouring in. And I started taking action on those possibilities as a man possessed. Such a way I felt even sleep was a waste of time. The magic of belief is that when you take an action, it will result in a growth. I became the first chartered accountant from the township. It's amazing how things change so quickly. Brickbats to bouquets. Most wanted to most loved. Raju 35 to Raju 100. In fact, a couple of marriage proposals also came in. I was in the zone where nothing is impossible. I joined financial analyst course. I enrolled myself in MBA and even joined Agora speakers. I was so excited to be among those enthusiastic people. One fine day, you know, Ben Bang, when he asks you something, you can never say no to him. He said, Raju, can you be the meeting evaluator? I said, no problem. The bombshell was dropped just one day before the meeting. He told me, the meeting is going to be in a reverse order. Excuse me? Yeah, when I'm supposed to open it, I close it. And when I'm supposed to close it, I will open it. So what do I do? Very simple. You just evaluate the meeting, which has not taken place. What does that exactly mean? That means, I need to imagine how the evaluator will imagine for the imaginative speaker. How insane. Sorry, please find someone else. Then he told me something very interesting. He said, Raju, look, over here, we expand our comfort zone by doing the things which we feel is difficult. Have a belief in yourself and take action on it, you will grow up as a speaker. It was something amazing. Once I started believing in myself, there was a complete transformation from a state where my mind was absolutely blank to a state where ideas started pouring in thick and fast. You know, something like when you're writing a speech, you select a topic and boom, 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 ideas keep coming. It was an amazing experience. I don't know what your goals are and what obstacles you have to overcome, but I do know one thing. You can achieve your goals. You can overcome the insurmountable obstacles if you believe in yourself, take action, and that is where the growth happens. Remember the person who was fired? He was Steve Jobs. Next time someone tells you you're fired, you need to tell them only one thing. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to discover Steve Jobs within me. For me, Raju 35 is history. You know why? Because how about you? Over to you. Good evening, Mr. President and members of the Agora Club. Speak uh, Club. On the 3rd of April last year, the Prime Minister of Singapore made an announcement that 
Singapore would be would have a partial lockdown, and that is to contain the COVID nineteen, and it was called circuit breaker. When the lockdown took effect, I felt imprisoned in my own home. I felt that my freedom for movement out of the house was taken away. So let us now define what is freedom. Freedom is the power, the right to act, to speak, to think, and to move as one chooses. Before 1948, the population of South Africa was 58.8 million. And the people were of diverse religions, languages, cultures, and colors. There were Blacks, Chinese, Indians, and Africans. But in 1948, the white government of the National Party imposed apartheid or apartheid on the population. Apartheid or apartheid, the other word for this, apartness. And the apartheid was a political and social system where the people were divided by their races. And different races were forced to live separately from each other. The Blacks were the worst off. The Blacks had to, and the colored ones, had to carry special passes. And they were restricted in many ways and in jobs. They were restricted in going to places like cafes, cinemas, and even beaches. It was a terrible and massive lockdown for 40 long years. Into this scene, Nelson Mandela came in. In his village, his father was a chieftain of the Tembu tribe of the Kausa speaking people, which was the second largest cultural group. He had his title of chieftainship and his land was stripped off. When Nelson Mandela went to primary school, his name and identity was stripped off too because the English teachers didn't know how to pronounce his native name and decided to give him the name Nelson. Nelson continued to study and he went to the University of Fort Hare, but he dropped out of school because he was poor, he had to work and he continued his study through correspondence. It was a difficult time for him. He really, literally had to burn his candles at both ends. But he passed in 1952 and became a, an attorney. And together with his good friend, Tambo, they started the first black law practice of South Africa. Actually, in 1942, Mandela start, joined the ANC, African National Congress, and he started to participate in peaceful protests against the government, much like what we are seeing and witnessing recently in our region. But these peaceful protests were all brutally, brutally put down and said, so he said, it didn't work. So now I must change tactics. And so in 1961, 
he decided to establish the guerrilla wing of the ANC, which is called Spear of the Nation, which used sabotage, violence against the government, bombings, and so on and so forth. In because of all these violent acts, he and his friends were caught and in October 1963, they were tried at the Rivonia trials. At the trials, he admitted to the charges of sabotage and violence, but he was defiant and he resolved to carry on fighting for his ideal, an ideal which he said he was prepared to die for. They were all sentenced to life imprisonment. In total, Mandela was imprisoned for 27 years, 18 of them on Robin Island. And his room, we all know the size, was that of a toilet in a five-room flat. I respect and admire Nelson Mandela for his courage, for his resil uh, for his courage, for his leadership, for his continued struggle to fight for freedom. And as a tribute to him, I have written a poem called I Am 4664. Beyond my eight by seven cell of hard gray cement floor, lay vast expenses of rocky soft gold. Its atomic power number is 279. My prison cell is five, four, six, 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 four. Beneath my proud skin, black and silent, lay my handsome heart, fired, not subdued. Writing, waiting, pacing, planning for liberty for my country's vast, rich land and its people, forfeiting my freedom for 27 years. Freed into an apartheid and slave country, once split, shamed, and sped on as skunk of the world, I serve as president for four short years fulfilling my dreams and my ideals of a democratic free society. Harmonious, equal, not black nor white, but rainbow-like, an ideal for which I was prepared to die for and might. And die peacefully I did, a life well lived till 95. Now, around my well-kept, trodden grave, post 2013, rainbow ribbons scattered, ruined and ripped. Some dig for rotten golden leaves to lock them in iron safes. May the legacy of Nelson Mandela's ideal, the fight for freedom, democracy and equality continue to live in our lives. Okay, a hero. What is a hero? And what kind of person do we perceive as a hero? I'm sure if you ask this to many people or to myself as well, a hero is someone that you look up to, a role model, someone who perhaps you want to be like in the future. But for me, I am trying to find that hero within 
myself. Ladies and gentlemen, many times in our lives, we strive to be somebody else. And perhaps it's not always going to be a conscious thing that we realize in ourselves. It's subconscious and it goes against um, the things that we realize many times. Let's say in social media, perhaps, or maybe your environment, we see all of these amazing people who are successful, who have such great careers and they got their life together. And then you start thinking for a moment and you see yourself, am I that kind of person? Can I actually strive and become the person that I see as amazing, that I see as that hero? And maybe oftentimes you start to compare yourselves with those people, with those who you see is more superior and that you are rather inferior when coming into presence. And I have definitely experienced that kind of feeling quite a bunch of times throughout my life. A lot of people will tell me that I am a very confident person and that I'm always willing to step up and do a bunch of things. And they see me as their role model as well. But I wasn't able to realize that about myself. Perhaps there's this self-deprecating feeling that I hold against myself, saying that I might not be worth it uh, with to other people or that I'm not able to contribute or share many things. But what's the reality? It turns out that many people do look up to me. And that was something that I tend to just conceal for myself because I all have these clouded thoughts saying that I am not good enough. But because of these people, because of the friends that I have around me who are willing to let me recognize all the potential that I hold, I was able to find the hero within myself. So ladies and gentlemen, there are many times where we are going to be struck down and we're going to be, um, what is it, just inside the slums of life and we don't know how to get back up. That, which is why it's very important for us to not look outside, to not, to just, you can just put the shut down from other people and take a moment to realize and look into yourself. What are you worth? Are you able to find that hero within yourself? Are you able to strive and become who you truly are and who you're truly comfortable with in your own skin? And that is something that is way more important than striving to be someone else or to become another person. Find that hero that is in yourself. And I'm sure that you will live a very peaceful and fulfilling life. Thank you. It was hot as hell. The Middle Eastern sun shone on me like crazy and I was sweating in my black jacket as I got into the hall. The hall was brimming with people as I walked my way, as I made my way to the stage, my wife and the audience looked at me and smiled. This was going to be the best moment of my life, I thought to myself. And I recall a week ago, as I prepared for my speech, my wife helped me out. My daughter helped me out. My son was in the audience also during the trials. I practiced it so much in the bathroom, in the hallways, in the markets, everywhere I walked over the past two weeks. As when my name was called over to address the audience, I stood straight and erect at the lectern and smiled at the audience. I said hello 
and murmured a few words from the prepared speech that I had in my hand, and I froze after that. I was like a treed raccoon. I was like a hare caught in the headlights of a car. I could see nothing. I was blinded. I don't know what I said after that, and I got off the stage. It was the worst moment in my life. We were a close-knit community there. My wife didn't venture out of the house for the next few weeks. And everybody I met in the hallway did not say anything, just said hello to me and walked past me. It was the most embarrassing moment in my life. That was my attempt at speaking in public for the first time facing over 500 people. Uh, later that week, one of my friends introduced me to a community that practice speeches. And he said, Koka, you need to try this. Hesitantly, a week later, as a guest, I joined the group. Over the years that went by, in 2008, I competed at a club contest, and I won. It was joy, no bounds at all. And off I went to the next level contest that was the area I won. And I pumped my fist and said I could do it. I went on to the division contest, and I went past the division contest. I was at the district. I practiced so hard. My wife gave me all the support. My children were there too. But if you remember my wife's embarrassment that I mentioned earlier, she swore that she would never attend a meeting or a contest where I spoke. Till date, she never did, and she doesn't want to. So at the district contest in 2008, I won. It took me to the international contest held at Calgary, Canada in 2008. I stood third at the interdistrict speech contest. That was my triumph with public speaking. In the year that came after, that was 2009, I competed again. I went all the way to USA again to compete at the world champion of public speaking at the semifinals. I did that five consecutive times. I have won the district speech contest an incredible seven times, a record nobody in the Middle East will beat. It will take a long time before that record is really beaten. Over the years, I discovered another institute that could speak, teach people to speak effortlessly, taking baby steps. In the year 2014, I joined this group. Agro Speakers International was founded in Spain, Madrid. I met this great gentleman named Alex, who was very passionate, and he founded this organization. And over the years now, Agro Speakers has its presence in 70 different countries and 150 club, more than 150 clubs worldwide. Now, what do you do at this club? You take baby steps into speaking and you progress. And your speaking is going to be 
in a very stepwise, very structured, and it's self-paced. AgriSpeakers International has its motto that says, we empower people to become brilliant communicators and conference leaders who will actively build a better world. We encourage a lot of out of club activity at the club as projects, not something you just sit in the club and give speeches about. You could go out and your projects could lead you outside the club where you have to do it in regular community-like settings. That's what Agro Speakers differs in. It is about the projects that you do here. We have some unique regular activities that include critical thinking, debates, and language games. Most of all, we have fun. This year or last, we, with this pandemic, we were confined to our houses. But I traveled far and far and been to different places all across the world. I've been to Romania. And I go there every Sunday as I enjoy the club run by Gabriela, the ambassador to agro-speakers for Romania. Likewise, I also join Singapore as Bampain runs the club, a thorough leader, a thorough professional, a great friend of mine. This photograph, as you see on the side, is the photograph at Portugal as we celebrated our first annual convention of agro-speakers at Lisbon, a city so romantic I fell in love with it. Now, communication is among the most commonly listed employability skills demanded across the industries and disciplines and professionals. And what you can learn here at Agra Speakers can set you up for a great job for the promotion you're looking for for that little fame and fortune that I got with learning to speak in public. Agra Speakers is something I endorse and I would like you to try too. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Shauna George and the topic for, of today's evening is my hero. For the longest time, I have thought about who my hero is. And one of the definitions of hero is somebody who's admired for their courage, outstanding achievements and noble qualities. And by that very same token, I thought about Mahatma Gandhi, the man who got independence for India without the use of violence. I thought of Helen Keller, who couldn't speak or uh, couldn't hear or see, but who learned to speak. And then I thought about you and me. I thought of all the people around us and I thought, aren't we also heroes? You know, life is actually very interesting. I, I was suddenly taken back to a time when I was eight years old and it was a room full of people. And it was the meeting of the Indian Medical Association. Speeches were going on, and it was my father who was talking about nonverbal communication. And listening to him in the 80s inspired me. But I must say that I'm not a very vocal person. Many years fast forwarding, about 30 years later, in September of 2017, a friend of mine called Ivy brought me to Agora Singapore Speakers. And that day, I wasn't sure why I was there. Today, looking back, I realize I have come a long way. I no longer stutter like I used to. I no longer look for words, and I hope there are pauses in my speech. But this is, this is all thanks to a, a little man who was sitting in the middle of the room that I came in, walked into that evening on, on September 2017. And that was none other than Mr. Gay Van Peng. 
He is the president and the founder of Agora Singapore Speakers. I know that now, but then I did not know who he was. And there was also something else that happened at that time. I was without a job. I was, um, my family life was falling apart and I did not know what to do. And it was at that moment or the next day that Mr. Gay offered me a job in his company. It is not often that many people will do that. And that too, I was paid a salary that was reasonable, more than reasonable. But the thing is, now at this point, let us look at who a hero is. Is a hero just somebody who's, is it, a, is it, a, it, is it his strength that makes him, his, makes him a hero or is it the size of his heart? I would like to go with the latter. Because Mr. Gay, through many forums, has really kept me alive. I can say that really kept me alive. Because those of you who know me from many years ago know that I'm speaking much, I'm smiling much, and very much different from a person who I was four five years ago. And that is thanks to Agora Singapore speakers. A group of people that welcomed me and listened to me without judgment. We talked about judgment a little while ago because how important that is in our own personal growth can't be emphasized. Now, what else can I say? Mr. Gay used to bring me back home after the meeting finished and I felt like I belonged somewhere. You know, a feeling of belonging is something that I cannot explain. So for all these reasons and more, I will say that my hero is Mr. Gay. And Mr. Gay, there was one time, at one point in my life, where I was, as I was saying, things were falling apart. I did not know where I was going. And I found my, my, son, my only son was not speaking to me. And I thought where I was going in my life with all this. And Mr. Gay, despite being the man he is, the Honorary Secretary of Singapore, um, continued association. I mean, he's a um, person that everybody knows, but he's very approachable. So I called him and told him, you know, that I was feeling lost. And this one sentence still sticks with me. The mission is the journey. And that is something that I will always keep in my mind. And today also I'm speaking only because Mr. Gay is there. I very often wonder what's Communication is important, they say, but for me, communication doesn't come easy. So I'm wondering why I am here, what I'm doing here. It is only because of, because I feel obliged and I feel um, an affection for Mr. Gay that I'm here and I'm speaking. I thank you, Mr. Gay. And one thing that I'd like to end with is by saying this. Where is the skill in being a hero if you already, if you were always destined to do it? Thank you. Yep. Ah, well, welcome back. Have you enjoyed those speakers? That was fantastic speeches. Yeah, yeah. the Agora speakers are mm. very good, isn't it? Agora that's actually here. started in, in Spain. Mm. That's why they use the Spanish name Agora. Ah, okay. I see. Mm. Interesting. Mm. 